have your ears tuned up, I think you do, because some of you came before. And I hope that you gain a lot from this meeting with our brother. And of course, there'll be a question and answer period. And we don't have a time limit on this meeting. Hopefully, we won't have any uh, disturbances that will try to stop what we're doing, because we really want to impart the truth and the information. So with that, I'd like to bring our brother forth. Please receive Brother Steve Coakley. Hi, Steve. Yeah. Uh, brother, are we going to have an intermission? Okay, uh, so we'll go at least an hour. You all give me some concurrence here, then we'll have some soup and buy some stuff and eat a little bit. Then we'll uh, go for another hour or two or three. What time y'all got to be home? What time y'all got? Y'all got to be in at midnight? Get me in at 12? By dark? Home by dark? I appreciate you, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Majid. I appreciate you. How you doing? I'm all right. I just uh, had the pleasure of spending last weekend uh, with Brother Dr. Collett, and uh, he asked me, did I know his, uh, his spiritual father? And he said Brother Majid was the brother that helps him a lot in his moments. And uh, brother, I got to come and sit down with you and uh, share in some of that wisdom. Uh, we were together at a conference called Revolution 101. And uh, we need to have a righteous revolution. It's the conclusion or culmination of all of the things that we think and talk about. It has to have a conclusion. And the conclusion, conclusion is us replacing the ones that have caused us the difficulty and us coming forward to be responsible for the dilemma of leadership. It is a responsibility to lead. It's not something that can just be arbitrarily accused of being abused by the other one that we have to supplant that with something even greater. So I know there's a little echo in here somewhere. I hope we can pick it up or I'll just stand back a little. So I, uh, I uh, enjoy, uh, enjoyed last weekend. Uh, we happen to be there at the same time as one of the uh, African classical study groups were in town and there was a little friction between the revolution and the study group because uh, both of them in one way are combinations of the other. Got a little foreplay for you have a little sex, right? Check. <laughs> Don't nobody want to talk about it, but it's usually some goofing around going on before one culminates together. So uh, sometimes the study group people feel that if you get caught doing anything other than study, then you'll be in trouble. And we would hope that we would take study as something that trains us for application. So that study would never be looked at as the end of our relationship for our community, but that we study for the reason of making ourselves better prepared to assume a greater responsibility for our people. And so we, uh, we believe that study uh, is a process in training, but study is not the conclusion, nor should our people be held back for those that choose to just study so that we aren't accused of storing up stuff and confusing the climate and disturbing the quiet of those who just want to study and not look offensive to the enemy. See, uh, a person trained in the nation then must apply what his training has become. And so we in the community, we see on you you're changing your diet, the change in your habits, the upliftment of your relationship with other brothers and sisters so that we give measurement to your application of your training. And we know that the training is good and the training is uniformed so that we don't have three, four, five different armies in the same group training on different things and they can't come together when you bring the tubas and the, and the, and the cymbals and the drums and the horns and the clarinets together, they got to go off of the same sheet music. They, were, they got to tat, tat, tat it at the same time. And though they all play different instruments, they're all on the same sheet music. So we need in our community, this is a, something in lieu with our discussion of the revolution, we need to come to some agreements about the sheet music. For it's all right if we play different instruments, just as long as when we tat, 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 now we're on page 34, that we all got the same book, we all turn to the same page, with our different instruments make good uniform music. 
and that a series of those encounters will produce the result that we're looking for. A result. We must be looking for a conclusion. One of the things we're going to talk about in this discussion is uh, record sales and revolution. Uh, we hold our youth responsible for picking up the question of revolution. And if they put it down to maintain their relationship of record sales, we call that a violation for the revolution is longer than their relationship or even their years being born. So we don't want revolution to be synonymous with record sales and we only revolt when we're getting paid. Revolution is what we do all day because we don't like the conditions so we find no level of comfort. There is no relationship with the white man worth protecting. All relationships are based upon our needs with them, not their needs, and then we come home and develop or articulate our relationship with each other. So we keep in context and we hold them responsible for picking up the word revolution and we want them to uphold the principle of revolution and if they come to a conclusion about what or how we will be able to beat the enemy the question comes up how will we beat this enemy well if you're in a war you better have full capability which means that you got atomic capability well in our case that's where the boo boo bomb come in because that's some atomic power so that might be our hydrogen bomb uh, but my only point to say is that we may have we may have a violent component to the revolution. We have a religious component. We have engineers, carpenters, plumbers in the movement, builders in the movement, in the well, bakers in the revolution, crowd engineers or ushers in the revolution. We got some of everything. So when we make a conclusion about how we beat the enemy, we rule nothing out, not even violence. For the power to produce the violence sometimes is enough to get the enemy to relinquish their hold, but we rule nothing out, not even violence. And if it is that you make a conclusion about how we won't beat the enemy, then show the plan that you mulled over that didn't work. Because without the plan and without the time having studied it, we then accuse you too of dabbling on something that you haven't taken the time to study, so we resent your conclusions about how it will come about. Check. Check. So we're calling order on our own community as a part of a process of dealing with the enemy, and the first line we become responsible for is to cut the enemy out. We cut him out of the relationship. We now get our news from each other. Therefore, the enemy talks about what we talk about, not because they want to, but because they better be saying what we say to each other. Now no longer does the Post report the news to the Africans in Washington. The Post responds to the dialogue going on in the community. So the people in Washington love Dr. Arlene, and they're going to support Dr. Arlene Day. So the city council person says, I am responding to what is already together in the community. Minister Farrakhan already coming. The tickets already sold. The room already got. The people already are all going to be there. So the fact that I'm asking for a day for him is not because they're going to prepare for a day, but the day has already come. We want to ratify what the people have come to conclude. So it gets up there and it gets held up a little bit. Someone else say, I don't want to get caught putting my name on something like that. Here come a black man, don't smoke, don't drink, don't cuss, don't abuse this woman, and is a medical doctor. You can't bring him no cleaner than that. And then there's hesitation. Now there's Jack and Jill Day, Negro Woman Day, Uncle Willie Day, Toby Day. There are all these other days that ceremonially are passed by all of them. ADL Day. Simon Weisenthal Day, New York Times Day, Washington Post Day, Jack Kent Cook Day. Now here come a clean man's day and all of a sudden there's disruption. Now before I had left, the mayor refused to speak against the resolution. By the time I got out here and had a baby with sister, sister ain't here tonight, sister and baby are home together. She had taken back her comments of support and came in to the enemy and said yes I condemn those things that you told me to condemn and see that's where we got to cut the white man out yeah, right. That's right. right now for a while the pressure from us was greater than the pressure from them so she was with us then all of a sudden he come pressure from them and now she with them now that gives us a 
barometer of how well with how well are we doing well it's still unsafe for a man to stay on the right side with the people still unsafe that's a condition that is a thermometer of our progress or regress well, ain't been many been with us mayors and you know when they go to hand the key out I remember in Memphis when it came up they ain't walk around you can call the cities on one day they give it to the minister and three days later they ask them for it back sometimes they stick and we learn how to build around them and fortify them. Here come Mary and Mary. He employs the nation to be a part of the process of making the city more governable. And so they attack him. And pull upon his personal weaknesses. So we don't need to be personally vulnerable to the white man. Because the contract would still be in effect if the same brother had been in the position. So the brother go away and take the humiliation. The sister who informed on him. Or for threat of keeping her children or not went on back to California where she is now yeah. and the brother went and did his time and went on back to the community That's right. and put himself back up to support and serve the people and the people wanted him three to one with the help of the nation and everybody the brothers back and the whole point to it was the brothers and the sisters saying we will decide when one is through of serving us that is not your determination anymore those are our determinations that we will make and we will exercise this right that we have we're locking you out now Barry's under attack the first one come to support him is the mayor not because she want him she had personally called him all kind of names but now you know how politics does now the threat of him being mayor is looming again therefore I bet you if you asked again she'd be for the resolution this week because this week it looks like the people have within their reach the ability to do what they need to do when they want to do it. We did it in Chicago with Harold Washington until they killed them. That we can show that we can make 99.9% .9 of them work together. And that's a scary moment. That sends off an alarm in the enemy. And that, that, that brings another level of reaction. And we need to talk about how we signal certain reactions that will come our way. But we give knowledge of the fact that no longer are people waiting to tell us what to think they are responding to what we thinking because we are talking to each other we are locking them out somebody can pick up the final call and find out about the ADL the trilateral commission or the secret society said it's now in the paper so we're locking out the post so the post comes out and says is there a conspiracy and now they're working a story on the people about how there ain't no Illuminati there ain't no protocols and ain't no League of Just Men there ain't no trilateral CFR Bilderberger but they didn't want to talk about it we have saturated the community so strong with the information either they go with what we saying or they counteract that they are not in the primary news position with our people any longer. I could not tell you how many of these things move to supplant the lack of organized knowledge given by the beast to our people. We have supplanted his ability to provide the pictures in our minds about reality of his undoing of us as a group. And so we on the move, though the clock will never show the time. And that's all right. We just need to have that feeling about each other that things are in place and they're on the move. And we are in the period of the enemy being identified to us. We had this project around the country called Operation Freeze Frame, where we went back to the rebellion and we wanted to collect the names of everybody who came out since no violence, no violence. Not not to stop the violence about the gangs on the gangs and the things we've talked about with each other. I'm talking about the white man is on the ropes. And he getting beat, his policemen are retreating, and the Hispanics are even out in the street. I, you know, I used to be worried about them. I thought they was just interested in jobs. They used to scare me. No, they used to scare me that they were so happy to be here and that they love the white man so well that if we ever got them on the ropes, they may come to defend him. But, uh, the ranks of the white man have thinned and even Julio then stepped over and got him some licks in too. So we give thanks to know that sums up with them that they wasn't as loving gringo as we thought and that others may come out under other circumstances to show their disapproval of the beast too. So we just have to make sure that we're responsible for the climate. We don't know what all is going to happen when the weather gets to acting funny. So, uh, 
we are doing Operation Freeze Frame because we think that if we go around the country and we find out who exactly went to the street. I was in Atlanta when the rebellion came down. And I want to tell you, they were grabbing white people downtown at the Martra, at the state capitol, at the city hall, at them little stores down there, Gimbals and Macy's or whatever they had down there. The youth and the others were grabbing white people. The reporters got beat especially. Oh, yes, Take the cameras, they filmed, took that, sent them home with hickey, and their pockets empty. <laughs> but my point is, is that in Atlanta, there was deep resentment against the white man that got capped by seeing that maybe now's the time and they beat white people on the street, any white person they could find. They didn't grab a white person and say, are you an NAACP? Are you got an urban legal car? They just beat each and every one of them. And there's no greater fear of the white man than to be beat arbitrarily for no reason at all other than his color. And we mentioned that last time we were here, we did a tape on the ride report in Long Beach, a big videotape lecture. It's $40, I highly recommend it. But just that Sunday, we talked about the fear of the white man. And that Monday's LA Times came out, and I'm going to show you front page story, whites fear in rebellion being beat. It said, whites greatest fear came true in rebellion. Whites were beat because of their skin color. And there were some good whites in the paper in Atlanta that got beat. They said, I went to stand and with the revolution and go down to the state capitol there and fight with the, with the youth. And I got beat up. And they said, well, do you feel bad that the black people who you went to support got, got, got beat you up? He said, no, actually, if, if they felt better because they beat me, I'm happy. Because I know my race ain't been good to the black people. And if beating me helps somebody feel better, I'll take a few lumps. That's my kind of white guy. That's my kind of white guy. I like that. I like that. So, so we're interested. I remember in Atlanta, here come the youth left the campuses. Now here you got Morehouse, Spelman, Atlanta, Clark. This is the bougie of the bougie. This is the cream. This is the Huxtable crowd here. This is everybody's hanging out on that set. And so it was very unusual to see the youth with the biggest stake in the system go to downtown Atlanta and attack white people. Which means that the white man is counting on a cadre that may not develop. He may be counting on someone who may look like him and for support of his university and system, but if it breaks out, might not belong to him at all. This, this is a great possibility, and we need to calculate that in our understanding of what has to happen. And I remember watching the youth come downtown and Maynard Jackson standing in front of him, took his shirt off. He said, come on, uh, just please, let's leave the downtown. See, what the mayor did more than anything was to tell the people the white people that he will clean up the downtown. I will get all of them out the town. See, they had all come downtown. See, when the rebellion break out, where do we go? When the rebellion break out, it's gonna break out again now. When the rebellion break out, where do we go? We go downtown. It's like Underground Railroad. Which way do we go? We head north. <laughs> we go downtown. In fact, one of these articles condemning KPFK quotes a a statement I made on the radio one night saying, I applaud those who went up to Westwood and Beverly Hills and started towards Bel Air. Well, yes, that's the way to go when the rebellion break out. You know, we got to go up there and, you know, check on things. At least always get to the highest point so you can see better. Okay. So uh, we give thought to uh, looking carefully. I also remember Coretta Scott King and... Uh, uh, Joe Lowry and Andy Young, they had a big demonstration. They called the youth down to the Martin Luther King Center for Social Change. Yes, and the grave is there, the eternal frame, and they brought all the youth there. And they asked everybody to get down and pray. And they got to praying and humming. And somebody came in and sang songs. And Miss King was saying if Martin was here today, he'd tell y'all be cool. And uh, youth were sitting there, they were sitting there. And then they stopped kneeling down. They stopped bumping each other. Hey, man. Hey, hey, they said, I can't, I ain't even gonna say it, but they said, F it, and they got up and went downtown, and went down there and tore everything up. Not, not, not just tore it up, when I say tear it up, I don't want to make it sound arbitrary, because, for example, there was a police mini station on the campus, 
right there, the police mini station, and before the thing burned up, I don't know how that happened, they took the computers out, took mm. the floppy disks and stuff. Mm. Uh, then the place caught on fire. Now, you see, it's one thing you just burning stuff. Right. Something else that you see, when they, we know when the white man started the fire, because it usually started on the top floor and went down. We never burned nothing before we at least got what we needed out of it. Now we gonna burn a gun club before we go walking around. Check. Check. You don't go to no Fed Co and walk around and burn it for you. Find something that you might need, a screwdriver, a hammer, or something, a spatula for some eggs or something, you know. So you know when we did it, you know when they, they burned everything. They insurance people. They burned everything top down. We uh, we went in at first when usually if everybody did good, said, so it was good, they didn't burn it at all. So I hope they hurry up and get some new shit in here. We can come back here later, you know. And uh, there's some people who went around after the rebellion. There's some people who went around after the rebellion and tried to spread the word that that rebellion was really the white man doing it. That the white man sucked black people out to respond to the Rodney King thing and that all of that was just an excuse for him to go do what he did. Don't let nobody fool you about that because when that cap went off and Las Vegas went down and Seattle went down and Ames, Iowa and Peoria, Illinois and Madison, Wisconsin and Atlanta, do you know what happened in New York? On the main black station, they announced that all the black people are coming down to Manhattan at 4 o'clock to kick butt. Do you know every white person was out of Manhattan by 3.59? <laughs> white people broke, seven people broke their legs at the, at the, <laughs> listen, getting to the train station, getting out of Dodge on the rumor that the black people coming. And so, no, there was no violence in New York. They gave Dinkins a big award for that being no violence, but it wasn't because it wasn't none coming. It was just they was gone when they got there. And what did that mean? On the mere rumor that the ones they didn't mess with for 500 years, here, 400 years, here, are coming to see them. Just on that word alone was enough for them to pack up. All them white people with them luxurious apartments all around downtown Atlanta left their homes and went to the outskirts of town to avoid an encounter with a black person. That's deep now. I'm talking about, we you know, a combination of things will make it happen, but we're not going to disqualify nothing. We're liable to do anything. It's by any means necessary. At least I'm that tired of it. And in the call of a righteous revolution, that's why I must have a righteous foundation. We must lay a right, we are responding. What I have tried to do on these tapes is to say what wrong the enemy has done. What is the basis for this? Sister just wrote me a letter the other day. This is happening in every city I go in where attorneys hear what I say. I tell them about laying this case with our people where we will try the white man here in America. And if we find them guilty, we lay claim to everything that he has incurred since his founding of the Constitution. And we claim that to be a criminal enterprise. And like Rico, we claiming it, Nico, we taking it. And this claim must be laid diligently, legally, and based upon fact. Now, we don't lack information on what all he done. We just ain't compiled it. So, all over the place, we are compiling the facts in each and every place where he stole. I used to talk about in the Identifying and Exposing White Supremacy tape. Any city, whatever you do, you should always be able to say who was here before the white man came, what happened when he came, who did he leave in charge or the founding settlers who run it now? That, that's a formula. And it always starts with there was some person of color who lived here first. There was a war when he showed up. When he won, he left certain people in control called the founding fathers. And then there's a group that is now capitalized upon that and they run it now. But we don't see them out of context. The first guy that started the war is as important as the guy running Occidental Petroleum now. For he couldn't have built his building without the other guy having chopped his tree. So we then call it a criminal enterprise. This is what they do to us. They call it a conspiracy. Right. And more of us are in jail. Rem Cohen said it in his article. Most of the black people in jail are not in there for a crime, but for conspiring to commit a crime. Yahweh bin Yahweh was just convicted on conspiracy. The facts of all, all of the charges that dealt with the facts, everybody was exonerated. So now it's the thought of the crime that becomes the crime. And so we say goose for the gander. What's good is good. Check.
So we impose in this righteous revolution based upon unrighteous activity. So we don't, this is, this is not a sneak attack. The tactic of it may happen at a moment of least a knowledge to the enemy, but he understands when they all leave New York at four, they know we owe them. That's why they ran, because they know we owe them. So who want to sit there after 400 years of capitalizing? Who want to sit there after 400 years of capitalizing and wait to get beat? Now, what happens? We was in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Sister Brown. We were in Washington, D.C. Uh, the rebellion broke out. I was to have my children in Washington. We were taking the car to Atlanta. We did all the same day of the rebellion. In Washington, D.C., here comes Francis Cross Wilson on the radio station in Chicago. I mean, in Washington. On the W-O-L, that's the main black station, 1450. Sister Kathy Hughes. And it's all right, just a chair. If sister's okay, we'll be okay. That's that tricky chair. Get a new chair. Sister, you all right? All right. See, see, God told me that whoever falls out their chair tonight, I'm supposed to give a free tape to them. I can't call the real world. See what? Now, that the, the real world tape is that don't have no label on it. It's just sitting there. I got about eight or nine of them. And, and and that tape is uh it's uh, I find moments to who 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 needs the tape just kind of unfolds so sister must have needed the tape she drew that to our attention and uh, so uh, she got the tape after you hear the tape you you that tape is very uh, very instrumental tape in my life I did it in 1988 for a group of college students and they went and spoke at all the colleges that they represented and. The University of Minnesota and Northwestern and a lot of schools were there, University of Kansas, and it, it was a big help to me. And uh, I hadn't found that tape. Uh, when they took my bags once more in the Dallas, that tape got stolen, the original. And I ran into a brother two weeks ago that had a copy of it in another city. So I got my tape back, and that's a very special tape. So let's see what happened if something happened because that tape floated around. I don't want to beat that off of the account. So uh, sister went on the, the, the TV there, radio station there, and she call for the people not to rebel. She said that there should be no violence. And she spoke uh, about telling the people not to be violent. And she uh, said that uh, uh, that uh, we should, uh, she tell us like she tells her children when she works with children, that when they have to use it and they're on the school bus and there's no washroom around, that you have to learn how to hold it. And so she asked the community in Washington to hold it, not to, um, not to respond violently to what was going on in Los Angeles and other cities and and I just thought I was listening to it I tried to get in God didn't allow me but uh, she's gotten my message uh, if you're not going to be the one to do it don't tell somebody else don't do it listen to what I'm saying if you're not going to be the one to do it don't tell some, if the ADL is causing our community a problem and somebody stands up to deal with them don't you tell don't you mess with the ADL let the one who's fit to do it stand up and do it so if, if the youth if the youth they come to me and say look brother Coakley uh, we don't quite all understand the trilateral thing but we learn it and we don't understand the Bilderberger the three cluster theory but we know that whatever you're saying about all that Rockefeller is right now I got to figure out what my role is in helping us conquer the one who sits at the third floor of the big house. Said, now this is my deal, Brother Coakley. I ain't, uh, I'm in the Bloods, I'm in the Crips, but let me pair off with the LAPD and the county sheriffs. Let's kind of have a little uh, a linebacker for center, a tackle for a guard. Let's, let's pair off on the line such that if we can open up that hole, that we don't hit the door and take the door down. You get that next squad to go in there and secure that first floor. Then we got another team, tier two team, that secures the stairway headed to the second floor. And another team that maintains the second floor while another team goes on to floor three. Each one of those tiers represent a level of power. So if the youth say it's my job, to take on the front buffer, the OEO boys, the police, the army, the Air Force, the ones who are the first line of defense for the opposition. If that's my job, 
then let me do what I do. I have trained to be the warrior. I live under the threat of life or death every, every day with each other. Let alone, at least I'm willing to do it for a cause. So why would Francis Quells Welsing, or, or, or Coretta Scott King, or anybody want to stand, John McAdermott Lee, or Reverend Cecil Murray, why would anybody want to come out? And, 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 and say, don't burn the master house. Now, sometimes they say, sometimes they say, well, there was things going on. We don't want to burn the houses in our community. Correct. We do not want misplaced aggression. We do not want misplaced aggression. In other words, we so built up, we hit the wrong one. I'm so excited I hit this brother and not the one that did it to me, which I got to hold it till I get down there to get to him. So we don't want to have misplaced aggression, but we don't want to have demonstration either. Demonstration where the white man said, yeah, that was a good nigga. Give him 250,000 grand. Because I've seen him out there, Operation Cool Down. you going to go out. And I had to give pride to the nation. Because I was on the phone calling while that rally was going on at Cecil Murray Church. And that rally, the night that the rebellion started, had been planned 30 days in advance. That was Operation Cool Down. An organized attempt to put 2,000 black men in the street to tell the black people not to riot. Now, why we got the white men on the ropes? Why we want to help him out? What do we owe? What do we owe him at that moment in time? Why not just step, turn your head, and say, "Well, when it's over, when you get through doing what you got coming, then I'll go back to work or whatever the relationship is." But don't be the one to go out and grab him. So I was proud because the people told me that that night in that church. Them people was packed up in that church and everybody wanted inspiration and direction. They was tired of white man that it was only the nation that spoke to the people the way the people needed to be spoken to and refused to carry the okie doke on the people. Now that Bradley shows up, here come every leader in town with the okie doke. Our okie doke to the people, all y'all be cool, we all gonna get paid. <laughs> See, people know how to get money off of a rebellion. Yeah. Cecil Murray have made a lot of money since the rebellion. He got a hundred thousand from Barbara Streisand and two hundred and eighty-three thousand from FEMA. FEMA. Yeah, so when I jump him on the radio for being with FEMA, when they were negotiating the contract, they condemned me, the brother who had me on, the sister who had me on, for calling out a relationship and were threatening to sue me. Take me to the white man. Take me to the white man. <laughs> Or calling out your money deal with the white man. So the white man put it in the paper and they backed up. White man put in the paper, I gave Cecil Murray 283000 So Cecil Murray quit trying to take the tape from the station and sue me for calling out a relationship that he knew was cooking in the oven. See, when a nigga got a deal in the oven, he don't want nobody to mess it up. He rising dope. So he, he holding down, making sure the house don't shake. Because if the house shake, it make the dope fall. So we, we, we keep stepping up on all these deals and stuff. Every time we look up, somebody can cut another deal on the pain of the people. So we say, let's just end all this stuff here. We don't have to keep holding account with him. We don't need to keep, well, how well we going to, how well. I figured this out. If you ask the people, you know, if you're around somebody, they say, man, we're going to have to get the enemy. I say, well, just excuse me one question. Who is the enemy? Tell me. <coughs> 25 words or less. <coughs> and you need to know how you support them by what kind of answer they give you. Because many times people be all worked up and don't know where the sex organ at. <laughs> and so I know it's concluded somehow, I just don't know where to put it. So don't you get caught on no trip like that because you'll be plenty frustrated. See, the people I've been a frustrated condition worked up by people who never wanted to take them nowhere. They just work them up so that when the good people come along, here come the nation, here come somebody walking on the other side of the street not to get asked to buy a paper. Then here come the white boy that walks and what you got? How much quarter? When they see the white boy, they go to the pocket to pull it out. See the black person, they walk on the other side of the street. Now that's, that is a condition. That's, that's a circumstance on a person. That's, that's, that's something that rests on them that measures what we need to do. How far away are they willing to walk to avoid something cleaner than anything they've seen in their own house? That's a heavy, heavy situation. Anyway, so uh, we want to know who jumped out and did these things because we know it's going to happen again. So we want to know 
we all at least in an organized way who know who gonna jump out before it happened again. We just need to know that's important to us. So uh, we got Operation Freeze Frame going, and it's going for a reason. And the reason is is that uh, the youth who uh, have no stake in the system, we can't sell them Mayor Bradley. We can't sell them Mayor Jackson or Mayor Mayor Dinkins. Uh, Governor Wilder, we can't sell them that because that doesn't make it to their life. We can't sell them a weed and seed program. You can't sell them that if they finger somebody, they're going to get some money for fingering them. That's what weed and seed do. We can't, we can't sell them that. We can't sell them no operation cool down when operation ain't never paid up. We can't sell them that. They ain't got no stake in that. We can't even sell them a black bank because they ain't got no account. We can't, they ain't got no credit. They don't have no, they don't have no credit history. They, they ain't, you can't sell them that. You can't sell them a college education. Because there ain't enough people with one, espousing success for having gotten in debt for getting it. And we still haven't figured out why we learn from the enemy. And pay them for the learning. We haven't figured that one out yet, but we'll get that together. One thing you gotta remember during a revolution is that uh, all prison rebellions have been crushed from the outside. Now, next time you likely see a rebellion, just remember, if it gets going on the inside and it's going on the outside, remember, they're overmatched. Remember, they're overmatched. They can never quell a rebellion inside without the help from the outside. So if the outside is preoccupied, we have a front that we need to let loose. And uh, who better protect the freedom that we all enjoy than one who's been deprived it? So uh, next time it break, you might see it did happen and they suppressed it very well. There were two prison rebellions during the rebellion and they had a very difficult time quelling them because they need outside support. And uh, internally the jail cannot hold back uh, people who refuse to be contained. And we know that those are political people uh, in jail. We know that there has been some crime and mental deprivation of people who have transacted crime on their own people and against the wishes of, the, of our community. And we know that there have been deviations, but who are we giving up on? We're not giving up on anybody. For some of the greatest warriors we have have, have uh, come from experiences that included such things as negative activity. And now that we're witnessing the targeting of the youth, they are no longer willing to wait for us to get to an adult to chain us down. They're now trying to chemically assault the children, targeting the youth for violent behavior while they're seven and eight years old, predetermining their relationship in life by adding chemical uh, injections into their brain to control so-called violent behavior. And we're going to talk about that even more specifically. So we need to uh, keep up with uh, what the rebellion has brought to us and have a little discussion about revolution. There's something I want to say about revolution and I say it uh, systematically. Uh, we uh, talked about this last week. Uh, but I mentioned when you ask someone about who is the enemy, they should be able to do two things for you. They should be able to tell you who we are against, definite, local, regional, national, international and how their local is linked to the international. And they should also be able to tell us what we're fighting for or allude to the process that will bring us all together, that will extract from us a platform or through a plebiscite. A lot of people didn't know what plebiscite meant and I didn't know till I went to one. It's just a place where everybody is brought together to the best you can, arrive at a consensus that represents the people's wishes and you can make them one to 15. So we just need some sort of discussion about that. So we say we need to establish clearly what we are against. A concept of how they work. Some people call that the system. Now there's an argument in the community about whether there's a conspiracy or not. The ones that say it is no conspiracy say it is the system. And I say it's nothing wrong with that, but the system is run by somebody. Right. So we gotta put a name on that hypothetical thing. Right. Say we know that the cars go up to 120. But each car got a driver and we need to call that name. So we put a name on it. Now when someone says there's no conspiracy, step back because that means they have no grievance with the white people. If you haven't agreed that they have done something wrong, two or more of them, and that what they did was an illegal action, and that they did it in secret and manifested it publicly, if you don't have an organized grievance against them, then we're not against the white people because unless they conspired against us, they ain't done nothing. And so we know that they do anything. 
Yes, sir. Well, let me ask y'all again. Y'all might not may have. Did they do anything to us? <laughs> okay, so there's no doubt. So, so, we tap on the shoulders the no conspiracyites and tell them that that's too late in the game right now. You need to cut it out. You look funny. <laughs> so, see, we got Copley tapes and we got this book and that. So now that we got these things, that gray area is taken away. We know for a fact that information is available that will prove that that was an illegal enterprise. And remember, we go all the way back. We don't, we don't uh, deviate in uh, where is the source. We go all the way back. I did it last time I was here. We go back, or we'll introduce this book as evidence, the Masons who helped shape our nation. And uh, we go back to the, uh, the Masons. Uh, this is Henry Clausen that wrote the book. Brother of A.W. Clausen used to head the World Bank and uh, head Bank America. He also was head of the Masons in California before he became head of the Masons in the world. And he wrote this book as head of the World Masons and described their role in the Constitution, the significance of Freemasonry's influence on the Constitution cannot be overstated. The significance of Freemasonry's influence on the Constitution cannot be overstated. That means that no matter what I do, I can't exaggerate their role. Right. So now we just want to show that the Constitution was formed by a secret order. And that that secret order used the pyramid to describe itself, though they never went to Africa. So we know they have a tendency to impersonate things that they are not. And we know that as a female impersonator can pull it off until she got to take her clothes off. So that's why we peel them off with the information to leave them with few as hands to cover the spots because eventually we'll expose them for what they are. But we only want to say it for the point of establishing that this is a secret organization, that it had a secret order to it, it was anti-black, that's why they call it Freemason. So we just lay that as a cornerstone of our disagreement with them. And I, I just always have to do that because as I talk to these attorneys about putting in legalese what I have done in an informational way, and the attorneys are stepping forward in great numbers to be a part of this case. And we're going to make the case with our people. We're going to go all over the country and try the white man. And we're going to try him from a certain name to the name now. Nay now is the one that controls it. We will prove that they control it. At a point, we're going to go drag them before you and try them before you in a spot picked by you, protected by you. And then you will do other things based upon your conclusions. It's a natural culmination of this relationship. Anyway, so uh, uh, we uh, are laying the case, and the attorneys understand why we have picked the Constitution as the point of attack because that is the unifying document of the 50 snakes it is what holds them together here it is what makes them a unit therefore since that is the cornerstone and that's a Masonic term the cornerstone of the unity of the white race we know that as the point of attack and we know that there are even provisions in their Constitution that allow for some called patriotism and my name Steve Revere Check. The white man is coming. The white man is coming. So we just keep up with that. And we on on the path of pulling on that. So uh, we give uh, great honor and respect to the rebellion. And I thank the youth because the youth gave the adults some room to be able to allow them to get it together. The adults need time. Uh, because uh, they have to work out these apprehensions about overthrowing the opposition. They know the opposition deserves it, but they don't believe that overthrowing it is possible. Overthrowing the opposition is inevitable. Therefore, we are preparing for the inevitable. We're not trying to sit up and have all the numbers in front of us and the conclusions have to be foregone. Once you go about it, the other things will show up. Those are the things that manifest itself, the miracles, the extraordinary moments, those extrasensory perceptions. we got to allow that to play in a factor, but we got to set the climate to make it back. Remember sister telling me about having that feeling about needing, say I thought about Brother Coakley, I played the tape, and up in the next morning you up and called. And I can say, you know, the day before something just made me think about y'all, made me up and called. And so we find some correlation between our thoughts for each other and our reaching out for each other, which brought us together tonight. But we have to have the climate to make those things possible. 
said, we, the place has to be, brother, we can't have you because we have the place. You don't have to go find it. Brother say, I got something to say. I've already prepared something I'd like to share. So those two things can meet up, but it was that extraordinary moment that brought us together. We have no known way of understanding how we come to this. We came to this through other, other relationships, and we need to give more credence and uh, utilize more often our extraordinary capabilities. And that's something that uh, we are perfecting. We are in the pursuit of perfecting those things. I had an article up here I just wanted to mention in passing about FEMA. I gave a lecture on FEMA back in D.C. in December of 91. That's FEMA number one. Three tapes at $18. I came out here and gave an updated version called FEMA number two, the Western region, which deals with FEMA right here. It's on videotape. And even did a FEMA three. Well, isn't it strange that the hurricane and the tornado and the rebellion exposed FEMA. Now here is an element. Here is a network. We've been going, to, I've been sounding the alarm on FEMA to our people. Trying to say that these are the people who are responsible for locking us up. This is the, this is the Ollie North King Alfred plan connection. Now, when we start going out talking about FEMA, and I say FEMA people, our people say, what's FEMA? I said, Federal Emergency Management Agency. So then it gave me the need to give a lecture. It made me have to have three lectures to back up, laying down where is the information available that talks about FEMA so our people can understand that the National Weather Service, the uh, Disaster Control Agency, the Flood Control Agency, the National Civil Defense, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, who else they got in this? About 10 of them agencies together that make up FEMA are unified for crisis management. So they will hedge on a crisis. Now you can't tell me the white man brought on all these dilemmas to expose his crisis management team as crumbling in a crisis. Do you understand what we got to peep at? Here you boxing with somebody you don't know what kind of weapon they got. And all of a sudden you go, ah, oh. so they pull the knife and say, oh, nice. Uh, in fact, a butter knife is that. That thing you got a butter knife. Oh, y'all, oh, that's all right, excuse me. Uh, oh, you beat me. Uh, I'll see you later. I'm, I'm so excited, let's leave the butter knife in their pocket and not cause too much alarm, and let's go back and say, well, we know we can get past the buff boy because all he got is a butter knife. Right. Say, well, buddy, I got that butter knife repellent over here. Say, good, you take the first tier. Right. You see, God has given us an opportunity to see that the ones that he put in the position to handle the ultimate culmination of people disruption, they ain't got it in them. We found out that most of the FEMA people were political appointees, so their only reason for being there was their loyalty to another man, Reagan or Bush. And that their loyalty to those men are not enough in a hurricane. Remember we talked about the phrase was, do things in bad weather. Then here come the bad weather and the whole emergency management system is neutralized. Look at what happened in the rebellion. The white man ran into the Parker Center. Now here the people attacking the Parker Center. The white man locked up his side. The people out front, they said, let's go down in the basement to the emergency management center. Down in the basement. So they all climbed down in the basement. I said, damn, I can't call nobody. The damn phone don't work. The damn computer ain't even plugged into the car computers. Went to the little running and check on it. <laughs> Blowing the dust off the shit. Man, we ain't never even used this stuff. <laughs> then they found out that many of the stuff that they bought was sold to them illegally. Didn't work when they sold it to each other. And they just figured they wasn't going to never need it no way. So they never had to expose the Lockheed or McDonnell Douglas or the others that sold them the equipment. Sold them shit that didn't work, so when the shit broke out, they didn't have nothing to count on. <laughs> so we say, oh, look at them in the park of center, laying in that back. Gee, you attacking my house, and I'm in the basement. You attack my house, I'm coming on the porch. Right. But they attacked their house, they crumbled on the inside. Gates didn't even come in town. Bradley can't even call them. Look at what we found out. Black man ain't even talk to the white boy he controlled. True. See, it was worse than we thought. White boy been doing just what he wanted all the time. Hey, go give me one of them people from the nation and drag them in here and depress the people. Now think about what didn't happen, the shootings that went on. Think about what didn't happen in the past and even with the nation and then understanding Gates on the point or the county sheriffs on the point, then think back and think the brother wasn't covering us at all. 
He not only wasn't covering us, he didn't even have the authority to call the white boy and to tell him what he wanted him to do. That was worse than we thought. Look at the police running. The people, then the people come with the rocks and the bricks and say, quit, quit pulling on the sisters. Get up off it. The police said, hey, chief, chief, look, I love the white man, but I don't love him that much. Let's go home to our children. You see, probably when it breaks out, the white man ain't got as much loyalty as he thinks. Because he ain't been good to the slaves. Right. Don't talk about the slaves. He ain't been that good to the slaves he got. Right. That means that the slaves been working a long time, underpaid, disgruntled. Somebody come to me and say, Brother Kobe, brother, I'm, I'm in the system, man. I really, I, I really don't like it, brother. I just want to let you know, because I want you to know I'm a brother, brother, that I'm in the system, but I really don't like the thing. I said, brother, the thing is built on disgruntled people. Everybody in it don't like it. That's the problem with it. Everybody in it don't like it, but they still in it. So, so all I'm trying to tell you is don't feel bad. Everybody's disgruntled. That's what makes the damn thing work. They just ain't mad enough to leave yet. To let it alone, let it fall on its own. Anyway, so I thank God for exposing FEMA for what it was. The Wall Street Journal did anti-FEMA articles. The, this the Atlanta Constitution's front page story. This was last Saturday, September 12th. In, it's politics over skill at Disaster Relief Agency. It exposes the positions of FEMA, showing that the, when you look at the names, that the guy, Wallace Stickney, who runs FEMA's only claim to fame was that he worked for John Saluna when he was governor of New Hampshire. The deputy director of FEMA, now he got some background. He was former Marines officer, CIA, FBI, and served on the National Security Council, and then Reagan's Science Council. Now that's the ball buster there. That's the guy. Then it shows that the various regional directors were either staff members for Alabama employees or state patrol officers. And one guy was a cleanup man, got a, got a maintenance company as a regional director in one of the northern regions of FEMA. The only point to that is, is that that's all right. He can put who he want there. So we just look forward to the fact that just because they got emergency preparations don't mean they can handle an emergency. We just file that in our hearts and think about that there will be other emergencies in the future. Uh, we know that FEMA is the one that takes them to the lookout mountains and stuff. There are 37 different mountain hideaway locations. And so some of them are even right up in these hills from here to Las Vegas. There are spots where the Western apparatus, the Western Federal Reserve System, the Western uh, utility company executives, the Western phone company executives, the Western key university presidents, the Western key political leaders are tucked away into the mountains. And so we watch carefully because these locations are important to us because some of the people that we're going to have to bring to trial, we're going to have to fish out the mountains. But if they get, we, we got plenty of time to find them. It'll all be our responsibility and we will find them and bring them to, we're going to have judgment at Americanburg. Yes, sir. Check. Check. So you're right, brother. We need that. That's why the whole set is out of control. Ain't nobody accountable for nothing. Uh, I have up here something. I, brother Collett made a very profound statement. Uh, this is the ADL report uh, on uh, anti-Semitism, black demagoguery, and extremism. You all have a copy of this around? I got access to this? You all got access to brothers here? In the, I just need somebody to say for me. So I know that we make sure that you get a copy of this. Uh, uh, the nation is condemned uh, very prominently. And uh, myself, uh, Brother LeGrand Cleek, uh, Ice Cube, uh, Professor Griff, uh, uh, oh, it's a whole, this is a Sonny Carson, Al Sharpton. Uh, here's one called Anti-Semitism in the Final Call, a whole section for just a newspaper. And that's D. Coakley. I'm, I got number two behind the minister. That was an honor. <laughs> but you know, it's just savage, uh, Sonny Carson. But you know, Dr. Collin was saying something. We were sitting at the table. Uh, we could go right now, just sitting down talking. And uh, we were looking through the report. And Collin said, man, I'm only in two paragraphs, man. My, my feelings hurt, you know. And you know, and, 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 and we admitted that really the focus is on the minister as a representative of the nation. And he understood that, but he said, you know, one day my son's going to look at this and he's going to say, Dad, why you only got two paragraphs? 
But no, just listen to what he said. See, that was a very important statement. Our children are going to wonder, what did we do to help make the day better? So that when they will say, Daddy, how did we get all of this? How did all them hills become ours? How did Hollywood got red, black, and green on it? And how, did, how, 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 did, how did this happen, Daddy? And, 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 and we say, son, we all fought. And, and, and you see this slash over here is when we took the park of center. And so that cut on my foot is when we broke through the second floor. And, and he said, our sons are going to ask us, our sons and daughters are going to ask us, what did we do? He said, there was a day when black men used to fear for being marked in a book like this. That the enemy was so strong and so treacherous and we were so scared that just to be fingered by the enemy would make us tremble. And here we are fighting over the book, hoping our part is longer than the next part. <laughs> and I mean, to show you how things have changed, you know. It's just to show you how things have changed. And our feelings have changed about being insulted by the enemy and how we wear under our insult of the enemy and carry on the struggle. You know, you sort of feel kind of lonely out there. You know, I became a non-person, so they don't say too much to me anymore. It's kind of like if I go to the campus, they act like they don't see me. If the newspaper show up, I ain't saying that no way, so ain't much to gather. Uh, uh, but it's just that they, they don't, so every now and then when they reach out and try, oh, I say, oh yeah, good, beast still there. Oh, you got a cavity, beast. See it in your mouth, they open it this time. So we, we have uh, changed uh, our feeling about being attacked, and uh, we know that the ADL is a satanic organization. We know that they were founded from B'nai Brits or lodges, that this was a Masonic order before it was a religious order. And uh, I know that they played in Atlanta, the ADL tape that I did in Chicago in 89. They played it in two parts on the public radio there. And uh, they condemned them, the ADL threatened to sue them. And uh, uh, they attacked the people at the station. And they were so mad that they brought me to Atlanta. We had about 700 people out at that $10 a head. So we made money on the situation. And, and, and the people there did for having the gall to say, well, we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. And the people came to support them in their endeavor and having me. And so instead of them scaring them off of me, which is what it used to do, see, something like this would make them scared to have you at the campus. Instead of it scaring them off, they said, bring them on down. And so I know I did pretty good that weekend and met a lot of people and went back to Atlanta two, three other times. And uh, this became a very positive thing, which even resulted in the Revolution 101 conference uh, coming about. And so uh, we thank the enemy uh, for the attacks upon us, uh, for we appreciate it. And it's hard-earned attack. And uh, uh, I hope all of you make the list. Uh, we keep that as a goal for ourselves. Uh, and we all want to be there. There's unity in numbers. That's right. So we look forward to that. Uh, something else I want to say about the revolution again. Let's just keep this in our mind. That uh, we have these three sections in our mind. Against, who we are against, what we are for, and the strategy to make it come about. There were three things going on. This is really uh, the concept of how they work specifics on who they are a power analysis is established based on tiers tier one is the most powerful tier two tier three in rank of wealth and power so we talk about owners and operators owners and operators so we draw attention to the rose rothschild owner secret society no secret hand clasp no secret handshakes no secret initiation versus operator secret society like masons skull and bones, boule, that have ceremonies, rituals, cold phrases, handshakes, and other lower level type of things. And so we draw attention to uh, the fact that we must establish, all of us, all of us must have a book like this. It's hard to be in the action arena without having a computation of the enemy. All of us should have a black book or a set of tapes or a set of information that could at any moment put us in the position of teaching another person about the enemy. Uh, our actions become uh, negligible when they're not in focus of who it's after. How can you go hunting without knowing which animal you're looking for? You might have brought the rabbit sized bullet and you got a deer on your hand. Check. So, 
the point you go hunting, you can't be out there hunting. Say, where you going, brother? Say, brother, well, I'm hunting. Say, you know, I'm hunting for the white man. Well, brother, you out here in the lake, you ain't going to find nothing but fish. <laughs> and you use a fishing pole for that. You can't use no bazooka down in the water. That's, that's the right tool, but the wrong location. Sometimes we show up like that. We show up in fires with clay. Uh, we we, uh, we, we, we uh, reach in love and with no protection on our hands and get scorched sometimes. We must, we must, we must, it's just primary number one situation. You must have a computation of the enemy to be involved in assistance of the people because all assistance of the people is in deprivation of who have sought not to see that the people got that type of assistance. So this is a, this is a must. And a uh, concept of how they work. How do the system work? Specifics on who they are. A power analysis. Tiers 1, 2, and 3 in rank of wealth and power. Also, it must include a network analysis to determine combinations of power. So we know that in New York and Chicago and Atlanta, for example, the Rockefeller family dominates. Well, in L.A., it might be the Chandler family. So the Rockefeller family and the Chandler family has a working relationship. Well, when Copley comes to Los Angeles, Chandler, you mess him from me. Chandler says, well, good, because when, uh, when, uh, when uh, Marcus Lewis go that way, you mess with him for me. So we then have to make an assessment of networks or combinations of power or alliances. If we beat the American white boy, which white boy will come to his rescue? France and Britain more than likely will show up first based upon the combination of power. But this will be in our book because they say, oh, 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 yeah. Here come Britain. Well, we just turned to page 42, chapter tall, entitled, What Happens When the British and the French Show Up? Check. Because we would have thought out all these moves because this ain't but a chess game. We're going to check the king. So that's all in the book. Hey. Every week a football team got a black book to deal with the team they're going against. Right. The defensive team goes in that room. They study the defensive formations, uh, offensive formations of the opposition. They study them, study them, study them. The line go to another room. The, the defensive backfield go to another room. The key offensive players go to another room. And the special teams in another room and they're all studying the enemy. Now they do that 16 weeks a year. If we just use the brain power that they had in an athletic situation, profiling every member, how many shots, how many tendencies, how, how many fumbles, if you hit them left, if you hit them right, uh, where's his weak knee? All these things are calculated for a game. Basketball, football, most prominently football, they study those films. If we just applied the amount of brain power and money that goes into preparing for a football game, we'll be we beat them. Anybody that's worked professionally knows that the diagrams and the models used to break the enemy down are scientifically superior to an offensive. In other words, your, your preparation against something is far greater than its ability to represent itself. And so they understand where they, different teams know the brain power of their coaches. The coach that can break the opposition down, say, no, 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 I studied them, but this is where we're going to break them. I say, wow, that was deep. I mean, I saw that level, and I saw, dang, he took me under. They know where the brains are in the business. Who is the coach that can better teach his team a model that will have that team excel on an identified period? See, the rebel Bill Walsh, for example. The rebellion may take seven to ten days. Do you understand pulling it all off can take between seven and ten days, period? It isn't that it all happens there, but that becomes the last culmination. Think back to the wall in Europe. Think back to the Soviet thing. Gorbachev hanging around a group and the people ring support around him, two, three hundred thousand. They say, don't grab that Gorbachev. I mean, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Yeltsin. Leave him alone. And the other tanks go away because they can't bust in on him. And so because he starts saying, well, I'm in control here. Say, so, well, how is that determined? Say, because the people there are following me. Meaning that it wasn't the law that became the determinator, it was who were the people following? Period. That is the only question that matters. Any government that is not supported by the duplicity of its people cannot rule. Any government that, okay, I won't repeat it then. Now we move on. Very good. Now, uh, there are some things I think are very prominent. Uh, did you all see this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, 
title here. You remember last time we were here, the sister brought the story out about the uh, the babies and how Time Magazine was saying, uh, if you don't kill them black people by 2056, y'all was in big trouble. They say comprende and was talking to them. Well, this is another one of those those stories, you know, that uh, kind of depress us. But what I thought was tricky that the white man did, he was real tricky. What's our favorite color on the international scene? Red, black, and green. Look at what he did in the story. Look at the headlines in there. Red, black, and green. Now his story, I watch white people read this on the plane. See, I watch white people as they read things that are giving false projections about us. Look at that little headline. Little bitty headline, as little as it is. It's in what color? Red, now you think he just set up and jacked off red, black, and green on his printer? Look at the little, look at the little lines on the box over there. He wants all of us that believe in the red, black, and green to believe that this is the fate of Africa. Thank you, brother. The fate of Africa is not in his hands. Look at, look at what he's portraying to the people. Yep. Now I watch a white man look at this on the plane and go, ooh, and cringe you up and stuff. And the white man say stuff like, oh, we need to get rid of this. See what it does? And then they keep putting red, black, and green on it. Then you got people out here like cross colors selling clothes with red, black, and green, calling those clothes neutral colors. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. Huh. Oh, here we go. This is the Constitution of the Boule. We're going to have a special discussion on the Boule. We have some secret supporters of Boule here in Atlanta. Now, I need a tape player. I need a tape player. Now, let me do this here before I turn mine off. I was taping myself. Uh, you all taping the program tonight, right? you audio taping it? Oh, just video. Do we have an extra audio player? I'm going to go ahead and leave my audio on then, just in case something happened to the video. Uh, we need a tape player, just a cassette, something that I could play something to you in the audience with. We got any of that around? Okay, because worse come to worse, I'll turn mine off and give up the audio because I have to play it. It's compelling. I want to show you this computation. Remember I said in the first discussion about the revolution is that we need to uh, have this discussion about what we are against. I want to play for you and some of you who've heard it, who've been to the lectures. Uh, uh, this lecture is for the Pasadena, Altadena study group. So some of my friends who have followed me here, you must be patient as I share information with them that you have already heard. But I must do that. It's their lesson. And uh, it's our opportunity because I learned too from you as well. And I want to play you an encounter with Jesse Jackson on the radio. And the question is, he and I are talking. We both know each other well. And the question is, Jesse. You know, me and you, uh, we didn't fought a lot in the past, and me and you, let's be brother men, not that this rebellion didn't come down. But let's agree here before the audience who the enemy is. Let's tell everybody who it is. And watch, we come in with one question and watch him dance around this answer. Then watch us focus on one segment of the secret society, of the enemy, and then watch him dance around his relationship with it as a member and the vague memory he has of his involvement. Uh, we uh, hear that. Uh, it's very important because what I need to show you is that just because we have a book that says who the enemy is don't mean everybody's going to want to read it. Now what happens? This is the problem. We had this meeting. We all met We all met at Savior's Day. And we had this big coming and everybody brought the information and threw it in the pot. And everybody looked at it and the conclusion was that this is the enemy. Now, we got the books. We all that. Now, there are people who wouldn't come to the meeting. Uh, people who uh, uh, don't want to believe that what we compiled were the facts. Because there's always somebody they believe more. Good, good white sources or something. So, so, but we know we got to, this is it. This is, don't get no cleaner, no stronger, no better, more, no more definite. In fact, I, I got up here that Simon Wiesenthal analysis of the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. Now, isn't that interesting that you could write a book? and compel a whole group of people to go away and study every page, every line. Every page, every line. And when that study came out, that was a result of being compelled. You see, you are talking to us, and we learn, we love the book. We say, get the book. We read the book. We love the book. And here we are talking to each other. Here comes some third person. Don't be reading the book. The book don't say that. That ain't true. Not bringing us news, but responding to our news with each other. You see, that's why I said, when the white man been cut out to action, he gonna buck dance you swear he's one of us. He stopped trying to get in and out to talk. 
So the wife, Simon the wife is all sitting there saying, well, look, they're, they're talking to each other about this Jewish thing. And this looks like a definite book, and they say it's more to come. That means that the gray area gets taken off the set and people are compelled to own up to the truth. So we're talking about this compelling moment when the righteous have compelled the doubters to either get with it, get off of it, or announce they're against it. It's a compelling moment. See, the right information compels the set to change. They can't, they can't walk around and say, well, I didn't know no better. See, so you drop down the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, and I, I tell you, you can pick this up for disparity. Take Haki's book about black men and obsolescence, the chapter on blacks and Jews, and put it next to the secret relationship between blacks and Jews, somebody lying. Somebody ain't, somebody ain't right. Somebody looked at the same thing, two sets of people looked at the same thing and came to different conclusions. Haki says, is there a conspiracy by the Jewish people? He said, I don't know. This one over here say, not only did they do it, but look how they did it. <coughs> Details, look how they did it. Now, son, now, so now we say, now we say, well, okay, we don't have to have confusion with this. Let's bring them both in. Let's bring in the Boston group, and let's bring Brother Nationalist in. Now, present Brother Nationalist the information that brought you to that conclusion. Well, brothers, yours is so well documented. Well, we got it right here. We'll just wait on him, and if we're, if we're compelled to, we'll go forward. Now, if the brother reach in his pockets and ain't got the right amount of coins, then we say, brother, how did you come to this conclusion if you didn't have enough money? Uh, I shouldn't use money as an analogy. When you, didn't, when you didn't have enough, you didn't have enough points to make a conclusion that you gave valid. So, now we come up with, isn't this strange? We can now tell who for real and who's your buck dancer. <laughs> now, buck dancing gets defined by the best level of information. So now with the information on the set, we didn't cleaned up the gray area. Now, see what happens? Now, what happens when we end up with the black book on who run everything? Mm -hmm. oh, buddy, we didn't cleaned up the set because now people got to come one way or another. That's true or it ain't. I don't know no better yet. So sit me down. You have to say that you have to sit down and go through more lesson to see if you can come to that same conclusion. And so uh, we give uh, some understanding to that. Now I want to play this tape for you. It's uh, two minutes. Uh, you will enjoy this. Uh, I make a point. I make a point of saying that uh, my role is not to tell you who these people are, but to show you who they are. And so since I know of uh, Brother Jackson as an early warning officer that all of the things that we saw him do in Chicago and in other places always alluded to that. He was the guy that told the white man when the real black people were headed his way. And we know this for a fact. It's, uh, you'll hear it here. It's not news. But we're now making a case. We must make a case to our people so that when it breaks out again, we don't follow false prophets. See, this is what we, we have to cut out the ability for someone to cause some confusion. So we cut this out with the weight of information. So uh, we want to uh, draw some weight to the information and uh, we want to uh, get a little bit about what everybody does, what the roles are. Now uh, Jesse made it out here to the rebellion uh, about a day or two later. Yeah, I turn around. I'm just rewinding it now. And uh, Jesse made a point of coming here uh, during the rebellion and he went on Arsenio Hall show one night and he announced that he was having a big leadership meeting back in Washington where over 298 leaders met from around the country. He's now on radio in Washington DC and he's being asked what happened at the meeting and what will happen with the information from the meeting. And uh, this is his uh, reaction. And uh, I also after this talk to you about Cecil Murray because you will see why Jackson had to take his meeting back to Washington and he couldn't hold it in California because a new set of white people have decided that Cecil Murray is going to be the chief control agent on this end of the planet and so all the others got sent away. I mean everybody for Sunday morning, Nightline, everybody did their show from Cecil Murray Church. Any, any white person want to be an honorary black person, they go to his church and he wave his hand over and put a kente on their shoulder and they become honorary nigger. <laughs> and I'm not saying it just to put him down, but I know uh, 
We talked about on KPFK just a week and a half ago about Geronimo Pratt. Pratt. And I'm going to show you that every picture that went out around this country with Cecil Murray in it had Julius Butler in it too. And Julius Butler is the FBI informant that secured Geronimo Pratt in jail. Now I want Geronimo out and the brother that put him in hang up on the Cecil Murray. And we believe that Cecil Murray should give him back to us. He belongs to us as long as brother's still in jail. And it, since he was heavily into the FBI, beat people with his pistol to get them to inform on this brother. And we know this brother to be a good brother. We want this brother back. And the brother, we won't forget the brother. And we remember we was looking for O'Neill, the brother who told on Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. And right after he shot that film on Eyes on the Prize, and we knew he was still around, and everybody went looking for him, the nigga just ran down in the middle of traffic on the busy expressway in Chicago and let himself get hit by a car and killed himself. Before we got to him. He had been in hiding for a long time. Now let's see if we got the sound right and everything work out here. It's such a meeting trying to get as many people to come and yet not have a, you know, your ability to have a mass meeting and get something done is not, is not great. We do not want to have a mass meeting and a preaching session. We want to get people to basically coordinate. People were there from Chicago, from St. Louis, from East St. Louis, from Kansas City, from Seattle from L.A., or from New York, or from Maryland, or from Virginia, from South Carolina, all of them in their own way were, were marching, or protesting, or making statements, or having press conferences. It was some feeble attempt to coordinate our activities, and the group that did come began to lay out some plan of action that they are now taking back to the several communities. And there will be more meetings, I am sure. And nobody is, 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 is denied the right to have a meeting. Now, the, 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 the findings or the recommendations from that meeting are available to? To everybody. And people can get them by calling? Well, you can call the Rainbow at 728. 1180, 728, 1180. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, what we, the first issue there was to A, coordinate a calendar of non protest around the country, number one. Did you hear that? You need to hear it again? What did he say? He said he had 298 people in a room in Washington. The white man is on the ropes. L.A. still burning, Atlanta still in tension, martial law, Madison, Wisconsin going off, Ames, Iowa going off, white men on the ropes. It's like wrestling. The, the one team that put them on the ropes, now they go back, they tired, they need to change shifts, they get Jesse Hand, Jesse jump in the ring. Now y'all know how wrestling works, because I know I caught y'all watching wrestling. <laughs> and the tag team dude shows up, tag team dude jumps in, and instead of powering him back on the ropes, he circles him and says, now who want to hit him next? Tell me now. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to say, we watched carefully when the white man got on the ropes. Who come, see, see who come put Massa House out. Mm -hmm. Put the fire out at Massa House. Let's just sit back here and watch this here. I can't wait to see who show up. I was surprised when Francis Quest Wilson showed up. I knew Jesse was going to do it. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when she did it. I don't have but one way of understanding it. I don't know any other way of understanding putting the fire out of his house. Or saying, don't take no matches his way when you ain't the one doing it. Now Jesse now gets on the set and now he's in the big mood. Well you can call the Rambo at 728-1180-728-1180. And, and basically what we, the first issue there was to A, coordinate a calendar of non protest around the country, number one. There are a lot of activities taking place as opposed to having 50 little bigger things, we're trying to have bigger events, bigger protests under the guise of having bigger protests. Now raises the question up that we have got to come to some conclusion on. What is the difference between a protest and a hotess? A hotess. Where people whose butts don't belong to themselves sell a little booty. Sell a little booty from the people. A hotess. So Jesse calls for hotess around the country. Now, whole testing usually gets permits for their parade. I'm going to have me a whole test. I'm real mad. I'll call the captain up and bring the form down. 
That's how mad they are. They go tell them what way they walking. Now you're going to be so mad, you're going to tell them which way you're going. <laughs> and then they say, well, we don't really want you walking down this street. You got to walk down this street. You say, okay. <laughs> or you want to march at midnight, and they say you got to march in daylight. And you say, okay. <laughs> and that's where we got to come up with the difference between a protest and a hotest. So that's why, because then, then you go see the next thing is, the next thing is, well, who is the enemy then, brother? Since we, go, we all worked up, what's the Where's where are we going? Now, now comes me and him. Well, brother, it's Brother Copley. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, brother, uh, who is the enemy? I mean, that's just me and you here. We brothers. Let's uh, come to this little conclusion about who it is, because if we don't settle this, then I'm going to be chasing the Rockefellers and the Rose Scholars and the Skull and Bones Boys, and you're going to be chasing for health care, and people are going to think I'm crazy, and the cameras and everybody going to follow you, make you a hero. And I'm going to be the GOAT. And I'm tired of being the GOAT, but what can stop me from being the GOAT is we come to this conclusion about who we after. This will, this will, this will get me out the GOAT column. <laughs> right? Okay, so now here come the next one. Me and Jesse on who is the enemy. This is get kind of funny too, so when y'all laugh, I'm going to stop the tape and go back because we want this to be into the record. Now, I don't care if it takes me 10 hours. We need to get these things into the record. These are things that you can study when I'm gone. And though uh, the brothers say how much we're going to provide for you, and you can stop at the end of 60 minutes or two, minutes, two hours, that's not the purpose of it, to just stop because we know what we're going to get. The, the point is that it's an act of service, so we have to complete the service. So I hope you all bear with me. For those of you all who may have to leave early who may miss it, uh, and I doubt that you will, but uh, you'll need to know that we have captured on the film the essence of it in a way that uh, uh, we can work off of these. These are working moments. Okay. Uh, do I now, a guy called in while this is going on. The guy called in and said, well, Jackson, you were all this protesting and stuff. I don't believe in the marching and stuff. So Jesse's telling him about the essence of protest, and I come behind that. It's another kind of statement. That is power in numbers. There's power in people marching in discipline. If today if 10,000 folks march down your street, march in lockstep, they could not be ignored. Because there's power in groups, there's power in discipline activity. Jazz that is cross talk, you're on the air. Yes, I, I think uh, what the caller was alluding to is is that uh, too often when the people march, other people step in behind them and usurp that power that they have just then developed and use it and rechannel it for other means and in some cases for personal anti-grisement. It becomes for us as a race a whole question of whether or not voting, registering to vote, and voting will deliver for our people what we need to gain from the ones who are in power. Now, we need a power analysis. If we had any black meeting over what we were going to do as a race, I have alleged that the reason we keep coming up with the wrong equation is that we will not focus on who really has the power. Should we walk on George Bush or should we walk on Rockefeller? Should we jump up into the Council on Foreign Relations meeting and demand a change in the world view of the U.S. government, or should we go chase the State Department? Should we get the ones at the top, or should we chase the operators that they continuously send to us to buffer between us and the ones that have the power? And in our community, the real problem develops when we're forced to come up, who are we after? If someone says we need the Ford Foundation, but someone else says we can't hang out with them because they will never deliver in the interest of our people, then we will have a conflict over who we will name as the enemy. And that remains the underlying problem in our inability to unify. It's because in most cases, our people have leads and roads to the people that we must get. We must get Rockefeller. But someone will say, no, not him. That remains the underlying difficulty, but the inability to name but the it, names it, it, of it, those who we are really after. It seems to me that nobody, for example, if, if you want to march on Rockefeller, there is nothing to stop you from doing that. If you want to mobilize people and, and make that case, then you ought to do that. Jack, I mean, we are it. free to fight back. Yes. And I say if it's marching on Rockefeller or marching on Bush, 
the, the element of change is non-activity. It is passivity. It is, it, it is, it is turning on each other. Okay. Oh, and, 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 and so, no, no, I would agree. Not, now, he just did a shift there. See, we was talking about the enemy, and he was naming you have the right to beat anybody, but then he shifts over and says, well, the real crime is on each other. The, the, the element of change is non-activity. It is passivity. It is, it, it is, it is turning on each other. Okay, won't you agree? And, 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 and so, no, no, I would agree that you ought to fight back. Oh, I agree with that. And 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 and, 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 and that given groups. Make hey, listen, 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 listen. Let, let, it was up in his chest before he knew it was on him. Right. See, was, we're peeling him off now. We're, we're taking away all of the... But listen now, just look, look here. Look here, this brother was in the movie Taps. He outdid, uh, what's my man named, do the thing? Gregory Hines. He, he had more moves than Gregory Hines and Sammy Davis together. So don't count him out now, because he ain't too dancing. He gonna jump way away. Don't, don't count him out. He's one of the original slick ones it is, now. It is turning on each other. Okay, won't you agree? And, 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 and so, no, no, I would agree that you ought to fight back. Oh, I agree with that. And, 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 and that given groups may choose one group may win the market right. and okay. the Okay, no problem. This is not adversarial. Let's take this opportunity to have this consensus. Right. When, while we are fighting, somewhere we must prioritize who is the biggest problem. In yeah. other words, it's all right if the Coakley Flank go chases Rockefeller and the Trilateral and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Rose Scholar and the Skull and Bones people. Right. Yeah, let him go chase them. But if we never come to the prioritizing of the enemy, then people will misinterpret a camera and the newspaper and the attention focused on one set of people chasing the KKK and the other people are left to make the others look like mili militants or radicals or kooks or crazies or untouchables or unwanted when they decide that they will chase the bottom of the problem and not the peripheral or the, or the distraction set from the problem. Well, you know, I, brother, I, I, think, I think that in, in that instance, because, you know, this problem is so multifaceted, one thing that concerned me so much as I went around reverse hospitals, uh, even while we were there in L.A. and looked at who was hurt and who was shot and whose families were, were grieving, that if, in fact, Rodney King had been killed by another brother, it would have been just another stat. But the fact that, the, that whites beat him and whites relieved them created this extreme reaction. I'm concerned that none of us kill, kill any of us any time. I, I, I have no problem with that. That's, that's a real source of pain no to me. No so now we got the white man on the ropes. We tell him how deep are we going to cut his heart out? And the brother says, well, the real problem is when we cut each other. And I'm really concerned about how we cutting each other. I said, well, brother, that's not even who on the table. If we're going to do surgery on ourselves, we got to get on the table. He on the table right now. But that's never mind now, because he doesn't have the right to get the enemy. He works for the enemy. So you have to listen carefully. Brother, brother Jack, that, that, that we know that if, in fact, uh, four or five hundred of us were killed by whites, we wouldn't have the country. No Where problem. Should, if, if that many whites are killed by us, then we simply let the patient. You have to have no problem with chance. that. But if, it, but if it's if it's black on black, if we are attacking each other with our tongues or with our guns, it's like all right. Oh. And I, I'm, all I'm saying, I think a part of our getting well. <clears throat> oh, we ain't getting, sick, shit. We ain't sick. <laughs> Talking about a part of our getting well. What? Well, that's not even discussing. The white man is sick, and we trying to kill him. And now you up talking about part of our getting well. I'm sorry, brother. We're not on the table. We're not in the ring. He's on the, he the one going down. He's sitting up telling us about how we're going to get better. Attacking each other with our tongues or with our guns. It's like, all right. Oh, and and I, I'm, all I'm saying is I think a part of our getting well <clears throat> and creating, Mr. And, Jackson, you know what I'm saying, and, and create comfort zones with each other is to make each other feel a sense of, of security in each other's presence. Mr. Jackson, I raised a simple question about focusing on the primary 
uh, uh, a core of our enemy. If we had to take a shot, surely we'd shoot at the heart and not the big toe. In your discussion with me, you went off in the black on black thing. I'm now trying to get us to agree that somewhere we as a race, some will be in on it, some won't. That we will go away and we will prioritize who it is is the biggest problem. And I would suggest that those of us who have studied, not been excited, but who have studied, are going to focus on the primary arteries of the people who we're after. Some of them are down the street from the White House at the IMF and the World Bank. Some are at the Brookings Institute and the RAND Corporation and the Council on Foreign Relations. And those of us will go there, but we demand that there be a central focus on who these people are. Therefore, I just want to make sure the tape is all right. I think our, our mayors who are trapped with the border. Well, let me just catch you back. After going through all that, naming all them people again. Most of us will go there, but we demand that there be a central focus on who these people are. Therefore, well, we won't get... I, I think our, our mayors who are trapped with the burden of servicing, you know, a lot of people they've elected to serve, they've determined... Now, here we go again. I said CFR, Trilateral, IMF, World Bank, Brookings Institute, Rand Corporation, and he goes back to the mayors. Now, now, the, my point to that is, the first, the first demand of a revolution is the fingering of the enemy. But just our mere computation will not be enough. You see, some people, in the face of seeing that one and one is two, will stumble and act like they can't add. You see what I'm saying? Meaning that just the thought that we got the information ain't enough. Because the people who know the conclusion of the adding of the enemy up know that if they go to that conclusion with us, they got to fight with us. If they agree to who we fingered, then they got to act accordingly. So to avoid that, they don't come to the computation. So just the fact that I say in a revolution, we got to finger the enemy. We must have a concept of how they work and know who they are specifically. Have three tiers, one, two, and three. And then have a network analysis of combustion of power. Just because we got that simple little process with that simple little book, we still going to get buck dancing. Now, one more. <laughs> My sister, Sister Tiombe, she then calls behind me. Because we're now trying to lay the evidence. This is evidence for you. We're trying to make up your minds. And so she is prepared to follow behind me, meaning that we're now making attack and we agree we're in tears. That I would take the first attack. And that we know I'm not going to get the finish and I was cut off then. That she would have to cover me with the second attack. And then the host, after hearing both of us, comes up with one of his own because now the climate for attack has been set. And though he would have never have asked the questions you'll hear him ask, he'll say, well, two callers brought it up, therefore, let me ask you this. Which means that we don't know how many are going to unfold when we lay up the tent, but because the tent is up, numerous will come under. So don't worry about where the rest of them are. They'll be there when you need them. No, not hello. We don't use satanic language. That's satanic language. <laughs> We we'll don't use that. That's, that's their cold word. They greet each other. Hello. We're going to talk about, we got to talk about that behold the pale horse and who Lucifer is. Because what happens in that book as in Epperson's book is that they finger original African things. Osiris, Horus, Isis, Mayat. They look at the original African things and they call it paganism. And then they take Albert Pike's interpretation of those things and they call it the fact. And then they pin that this original stuff was primitive secret societal and Lucifer worship and then they then conclude that everything we thought about was Lucifer stuff and it's just the opposite of what it is and then he uses the word alien now I'm gonna have you take take our name out and put his name take alien out and put his name in and see if alien don't fit then the pattern of who is alien and what do they call illegal Hispanics so when people start using the word alien don't always think they mean UFO Sometimes anybody other than the white man is an alien. And we know he's the only one that can't account for his beginning. Right? I mean, some say the oven. We, don't, we know he's some phenomena yet described. And the oven is just as good as an excuse as any other. Because he cannot tell you where he came from. And though he tries to allude to his evolution as the highest form of the monkey, no monkey ever ate meat. 
So we know he's not an evolution of a monkey, he's a deviation. If anything, never fit to stand with the wisdom of the monkey, he alleges a beast. Anyway, we don't talk about that. I said, y'all got enough time? We got gold? Do I need to come back next week? I don't be here no way. <laughs> okay. Jazz and his crosstalk, you're on there. Yes, uh, uh, yes, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. I got two questions. Um, one, I don't have a problem with uh, fighting and, and taking direct action, but don't you agree we should prioritize our focus to to place it directly on the on the people and the places where we can get some relief? And two, the previous caller mentioned that uh, we should be fighting the Council on Foreign Relations, but yet still when I look on the membership, it says that you are, one of, you are on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. Could you explain? No. Yeah, now watch this. Now, now let me tell you what it is. Listen, listen, now, this now, 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 now listen up now. This is discipline and discussion. We now lay out before him five or ten things that he could pick on. I gave him, if you listen to me carefully, I had two rat tat tats at him. On one, I mentioned Skull and Bones, Rose Skull, Trilateral, CFR, Bilderberg. On the other one, I mentioned IMF, World Bank, Brookings, Rand, and somebody else. I gave him 10. He could pick any of the 10 and go on. I know he's closer to some of the 10 and less closer to the others, so he could have choose any one of them. Instead, he went way out to L.A. Hospital and stuff. <laughs> now, now, we, now the question comes up is, is one of the reasons why you aren't calling these people out is because you're actually with them? So now, Sister brings out the fact that he's connected with the CFR. In the yearbook for 1990, in the yearbook for 1991, he's listed as one of only 2,398 people in the whole United States that are part of this organization. Only 2,900. In Washington, D.C., out of over 2,000, excuse me, in Washington, D.C., out of over 800 members, there are only 44 blacks, him being one of them. The chairman of the nominating committee of the Council on Foreign Relations is Bobby Eman, former director of the CIA. Now imagine you were in an organization and the CIA was the nominating committee and you don't remember if you was in it or not. And then he says stuff like, well, I've never really been to a meeting but I spoke at one. I don't really know what they do but I know what they don't do. Now listen carefully because we know he's a part and we know he's a functioning part but listen to the bug dance. The dancing ain't over. Tyler, I can be a part of finding out what's happening in the world but I would do that. But the Council on Foreign Relations, whatever it does, has... Remember that phrase, whatever it does. He, he now alludes to he don't know what it do. But he'll, when questioned, he know what it don't do. Do we live it while we are not making a priority on prenatal care? He said the Council on Foreign Relations, I, just, I skipped over part by talking, but he says now Council on Foreign Relations, whatever it does, don't have nothing to do with health care, education, daycare, health, uh, uh, the prenatal care, preschool care, when of course the people who have the power have everything to do with all of the symptoms that we feel, but now he's disowning the impact of their relationship from them themselves. So now it's, we, need, we got all these problems, but we ain't got nobody to blame for them. And so he's now saying that he don't know what that do, but that don't have nothing to do with why we in such a bad condition. Foreign relations. Could you explain? No, any time I can be a part of finding out what's happening in the world, well, I would do that. But the Council on Foreign Relations, whatever it does, has nothing to do with it. But while we are not making a priority on prenatal care, with all these babies dying, and Head Start, and daycare, it has nothing to do with why we're not in a sustained drive to reduce tuition and increase teacher pay. Hold it now, we got CFR on the ropes, he now at tuition. But if we win, we ain't gotta go to them schools. We ain't looking over no cheaper tuition, we looking for new administrators. See, the dilemma is confusing. Some of our people have never planned to do it out the white man and their goals always include the white man and what we're looking for is a comfort zone in the face of the enemy. And if you check them, they never had a plan beyond the day. That's why we need a revolution because too many of us won't conclude our thoughts about our relationship with the enemy. That must have a conclusion to this 
play that we in. It must have a closing act, a finale, a the end, a finis, a, a it's over, a out of it, bud, something that concludes this relationship. When I focus on that, I sense that to be the right thing to do. There are 12,000 students at Howard and 13,000 at Lawton. It cost less than 10,000 a year to go to Howard. And I said because it's one of the highest costs for black colleges in the country, about less than 10,000 a year, but 30,000 a year to go to Lawton. Well, I think that a massive drive to reduce tuition and increase scholarships not the BCFR. will make a big statement to a large segment of our population. It's a massive drive to reduce but tuition. While one population may be trying to go up with an own to college to be able to make a contribution, another population needs something very different from that. Prenatal care and Head Start and daycare and more funding for public education. You look at the gap between the amount of money that's paid to a teacher or principal in D.C., say in contrast to Montgomery County, that's an issue. But some people find that is where they intend to engage in the fight. So while you may prioritize, there are, there are many priorities. And you got to respect people's choice of what they choose to fight on. What is now? Okay, I respect your choice on who you fight on, but just get your ass off the yard. I mean, if you ain't gonna fight the beast, you on the yard where the beast reside. Now, you don't be out here trying to play football with boxing gloves on. So, if you ain't gonna fight the beast, and that's what's the question, then get on off the yard and fight for tuition. Go on to the campus and fight for it. Get your butt up off the radio. In other words, if you ain't going to be the revolution, don't play with it. Because it has a thought and a mind and an end game of its own. From a foreign uh, relations thing. Oh, hold on. Now check this out. Now here come the host. He did some buck dancing. In the fight. So while you may prioritize, there are, there are many priorities. He and begs for the right to be wrong. Choice of what they choose to fight on. What is what is this council of foreign uh, relations? The, the two callers have made reference to that. What what does that council do? For the listeners who may not be aware of what it's all about. I've never been to a meeting. I've spoken to one of them in <laughs> Oh, oh, Now, listen, listen, listen. You listen to an agent. Listen, listen. You got to learn. When you're working with an agent, this is what an agent sounds like. The agent gives you two totally different directions at the same time. I don't know what it does. Then he proceeds to tell you. I've never really been to a meeting, but I spoke at one. Now, what an agent is supposed to do is to give you so two diametrically opposed statements. What you're supposed to do is be so confused that you, in effect, don't move. You see, now remember in football, remember in football, now you got to play. You got a track play. What's a track play? The lineman goes down, the call comes up, and he moves like he's preparing for a sweep. Three of them go this way. The other line, looking at the formation moving to the left, moves to the left with it. When in fact the play is a track play, created a hole without touching the other person. So what Jesse is doing in effect is he only needs to get past you. Every time he has an encounter with us, he avoids a definite encounter. So to avoid a conclusion. See, we, we're laying the premise on him in a conclusion way. That if he don't even answer our questions by the time we get through phrasing them, you all will know what he do. He is an early warning officer. And you're picking up how one works. And then when you really get up on them, their goal then is to give you, say, which way are you going? South and North. Say, huh? Say, well, I'd like to help you go there, but I'm going east and west. <laughs> and you'll see that Mr. Southern will be on Saturday Night Live, he'll be telling you one day, and he was going to say, he said, I really want to help you beat myself. You know, he's telling you two things at once. You just have to listen carefully. Now, now, okay, now just think about this. Uh, we've now been on our third round of opportunity with the brother. He's got his third chance to clear away that, that a fight's going on and he want to get a punch in. We want the brother to say he want to get a punch in. Now, I could have called him and said, Jesse, you ain't shit. We all have <laughs> You're an agent? Excuse my language. You see, I understand what I'm saying is that we could have just come to him with a conclusion. But that would not have helped you. 
we have to help you understand it, so we have to do it in a question sort of way, but the questions with God's blessing are so definite that any deviation is what we're trying to show back to you. This is a, we're laying a case now. And when his day comes, he'll have to stand and account for why it was he didn't get his punches in and why he chose to assist these people and not destroy them as the evidence bears is their faith. As the evidence bears is their faith and no mere man has the right to deviate from their faith. This is a, this is a, a, a compelling moment on him. And no mere me or any one of us have the right to change the faith that he has earned. And we have a right to accept our own. Now, now listen up carefully. This is against, he ain't through yet. What is this Council of Foreign uh, Relations? The, the two callers have made reference to that. What, what does that council do for the listeners who may not be aware of what it's all about? I've never been to a meeting. I've spoken to one of them. And since the people who've been involved in foreign affairs, who analyze foreign affairs, who analyze foreign policy. All analyze it and what, what happens with the, the information? Well, sometimes they make it public. Sometimes they share information one with the other. But it's not, I means foreign policy determined by the State Department mm -hmm. or the given administration. It's not by a, you may have so a... So it's an arm of the State Department? No, 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 not at all. Okay. Well, no, it's not. Yes. I mean, the State Department makes foreign policy. Right. Based upon the judgment of the given mm -hmm. president and that Congress. Mm -hmm. There's more that president than that Congress. So does this council advise the State Department? Not to my knowledge. Okay. I, I, I think that, because two callers have made reference to it, and I'm, I'm wondering how many listeners are out there trying to confuse as to exactly what the, what that, the council, uh, the function of the council is. You you served on it as an honorary member or what? You know, I was yeah, yeah uh, I, I think I called the brother up. Good comeback. I Meaning he pretended like he was winding down. We said, well, what was your role specifically? That was specifically. What the, what that the council uh, the function of the council is you you served on it as an honorary member or what? You know, I was asked to serve on it some time back. I've never really been to a meeting, but I kind of know what it does. I mean, people who have a sense of world affairs. I mean, some are academic people, some are activists, some are people who serve as ambassadors, and others who serve in countries who discuss the implications of a given foreign policy matter. But it's more academic than activist. It, it does not make one policy decision, nor is it an advisory group to the State Department. Okay. Um, I want to ask you this, because I know... Now, of course, he says after that, I know you got to go, and it was at the hour, 1 o'clock. He stayed another 20 minutes trying to clean up that CFR mess. Now, he's got to assure CFR that basically he doesn't talk to us about them, because that's why he's only one of uh, uh, 44 out of 800 in a set with 2,300 and only 68 blacks nationwide. I mean, I'm sorry, it's 144 out of 2,398 whites. Of that is, uh, well, yeah, it'd be a good reference. Of those 200, 2,398 whites, there's 144 blacks nationwide uh, in the organization. So you can see that uh, there aren't many at all, especially since you know that 44 of those come out of Washington. When you add New York and Chicago and LA, you've just about gotten all of them, and he doesn't remember if he in it or not. And so uh, I, I want to draw conclusion on that, that uh, we uh, come to this understanding that, uh, that uh, this is an officer at work. This is uh, the deception that we heard was so clearly uh, relayed that he's to assure that he would never expose the white man at all costs even public embarrassment and I'm gonna tell you everybody in Washington DC heard this or came to my lecture two nights later and heard it and I played it every lecture since then in about eight different cities so uh, even at the risk of public embarrassment uh, he held the line and protected his white man and uh, I, I don't lack for knowing that he does it I used to talk about it all the time the little early warning thing that he used to serve in in fact, I'll pass this around. Please make sure I get it back. This is the CFR Minority Recruitment Package that was passed around Washington, listing all 44 of those black CFR members I just mentioned. I'll pass this around. You all can look through it during the lecture. Uh, this is an actual documentation of not only his role, but the fact that he was used in the Minority Recruitment Package to, 
to attract more uh, foreign affairs thinking uh, white blacks. <laughs> right, you know that guy who tried Rodney King, tried the officers, his name was Terry Black White. He was the black guy named Terry Black White. And he's the one that kept saying, we gotta abide by the ruling, we gotta abide by the ruling. I mean, he abided by the ruling 20 times after the verdict came out. He had no resentment. He didn't feel bad the case was lost at all. He just kept saying, we got, I don't like it, but we got to abide by the ruling. We got to abide by the ruling. Everybody got to obey the law. Even Jesse Jackson get a TV show. It's both sides of the story. That's the name of the show. It's on right now. It's called Both Sides of the Story. We finally get a show, and we got to tell both sides. So they got enough shows with their side on it. Now we get one. We got to be fair. Now. So, so my conclusion with that portion of the lecture, and we just want to move on, is that uh, in the process of articulating who we are against, it will be no easy task for the relationship of each of our different members of our race to the enemy will force them to come up with a different computation than ours. The further away you are from him, the clearer your insight will be. Yes, the clearer your ability to be able to call it as you see it, for no relationship can affect you adversely when you ain't in it. Yes, right. So uh, we pray for the day, we pray for the day we can get all our people back and they can call it as they see it. The second part to that uh, revolution includes the second part specifically includes four. What are we for? Our platform, what we want to establish through plebiscite. But before we have this plebiscite to establish what we want, we have to take inventory. Now imagine, we say, okay brothers, you take the Northeast, you take the Southwest, you take inventory. Every single thing in America must be inventory. How are you gonna take possession of some premises when you ain't took no inventory? In other words, when it's turned over to you, how you know everything going to be in it? In other words, if it had so many trees when they took it, we want so many trees there when we take it back. If the lake was so clean when they got it, that we want the lake to be that clean when we get it back. This is how you establish the amount of harm they have caused so that their other brothers will pay up. After they, see, they'll be given a chance to leave the premises, but their other brothers must pay up for the harm they have done. So we have to take inventory. How many skyscrapers? How many streets? How many street lamps? How many manholes? How many, how many street cleaners? How many brooms? How many dust fans? You may think it, it's a massive, it is a massive task, but we will never be able to divide up the goods and services with our people equitably unless we've taken an inventory. Because we took an inventory, we'll have more authority in taking it over because we'll know how many airplanes are supposed to be. When two, three of them are missing, we say two, three white boys got away. So how we know? Because the plane's gone. So how you know? Because we counted them before we took it over. Right. We know how many are supposed to be in here. Check you right. Put the census on them. Brother, warn me when I come in. Make sure you don't fill out the census. I ain't never. That's right. And we know FEMA used the census to find who went door to door. But we now got to take census on them. We must inventory every. How we going? How we going to take Bel Air without counting how many houses it is? So we say, okay, well, the Nation of Islam, boy, they did a real good job in the revolution. How many houses up there in Bel Air? Says 47 houses. So well, they've at least earned half of them. <laughs> how will we divide up what belongs to us if we don't know what's in the stock? And everybody wants something different. We still got to clean the streets when we win. We still got to change the light bulbs when we win. We still got to fix the sewers when we win. So we need to say we got 8,992 sewers. We need 2,000 plumbers. Now we know the plumbers that we're looking for ain't got no job, ain't been plumbing, probably ain't got no tools. But we got to know how many we need so that we can have a place for their contribution. You see, it will take some cleverness to win the revolution and have a place for everybody. When they win, the reason that people won't revolt is because they don't have a stake in it. So when we go around the country, we go to the simple, simple way. How do we find the, a, a way to include so many of us? How do we do it? We say, how many of y'all owe the white people money? How many of y'all owe the white people money? Raise your hands up. Don't be saying. Now, when we go town to town, 80, 90, 99% of the people raise their hand. So we have unity and debt. There's unity in debt. So we tell the people that if no more reason than you can stop paying, when we win, you free with the debt with him. You don't pay him no more. 
If you got credit, run it up to the limit. <laughs> so I said, bro, I'd like to help the revolution. And I ain't got none of these 20 credit cards. Yeah. Then run them up to the limit and hold. That's a revolutionary position. Yeah. If they want the money, send them a dollar. They can't put you in jail if you pay them a dollar. You have the right to pay them one dollar a month. They can't, and if they accept the dollar, they can't process against you. As long as you send them one dollar. So if you owe them a thousand, how many years it take to pay back? <laughs> Longer than they got years in leadership. Check. Right. So remember, you're always trying to get some relationship with them in a holding pattern so that when it breaks, you've taken maximum advantage of your relationship with them now before they're in the out position. And then we say there are consequences to winning too. Relationships with them that are affirmed and are enjoyed become null and void. College degrees, let me see the hands. How I many of y'all got them? You lose them. When we win, they null and void. Uh, everybody has not been accredited by any college of the people. Therefore, all relationships with college in the past are null and void. So, there, so there's, there's opportunity, and then for those that pay for it, there's disparity. We will know that you have great tolerance and patience because you sat through it. We will reward you for that, but not for having gotten a grade or a degree because that was no measurement of truth, which is all the knowledge we understand. We give no reward for cunnery or connivory, which is what he usually does. He, he rewards cunnery. The Godfather is a hero. He ain't an enemy of the people. Everybody want to be the Godfather of the good fellow, a John Gotti. It was a bigger demonstration for Gotti when he went to jail than it was for Geronimo Pratt. Them, them people that got him paid tore up the police station down there. He the mafia man. He killed people when they didn't cooperate. There was no justice in his system. Anyway, so we be uh, up on that. To establish what we are for, we must take inventory. So everybody has to inventory where they're standing. And then the last thing to that phase is strategy book. A series of calculated movements like chess, which is which must consist of an opening, a mid game, and an end game. Don't get in there moving pawn for pawn, and then after you lose your pawn, start trying to figure out what to do with your knights and your rooks and your bishops. Your whole game is a calculated of series of movements calculated in advance. Your whole game is a series of movements calculated in advance. And so every chess game has an opening. People can tell you different styles of opening. Queen's Gambit, King's Gambit, Rook Around, or whatever they call this stuff. And then we also know that in the process there's a mid game. How do you use your pawns and your early pieces so that by the time you get to the mid game you are in control of the board? Anybody who plays chess knows you can win with fewer pieces if you control the avenues on the board. And so your game is how do you, and sometimes you do decoy. You leave an important piece open in the corner, and the opposition spends time getting a piece. When as soon as they move that piece to get it, you have then using a smaller force to secure the capture of the king. Which means that in the game there is deception of movement as well. All movement forward isn't to conclude in the in forward position. Some of it is diversionary so that you may set up an attack on the left side of the board, but your real attack is calculated on the other man's defense, which moves his king to the right side, which you have calculated an incision that he cannot get away from as long as you can steer him over that way. And so we allude to that there must be strategy in our thought about dealing with the enemy and that it must have an opening, a mid game, and an end game. Now, it must also have with the strategy book, which is what the strategy book has, it must have a day after plan, an identifiable process for government or a system to preside over the goods and services. It must have an identifiable day after plan. The people must know exactly what their roles are the day after. Because if there is indecision after a resurrection, there will be confusion. So we must establish immediately who would not accept from our people that this be the law enforcement. 
They say them are good, clean brothers. We knew them brothers as order before there was disorder order. Right? And so then we accept on the surface, based on past relationship, authority and leadership that was harnessed from the people before it was needed. In other words, the people must base their decisions on future leadership based upon the relationships of the past. You're not going to let a guy here buck dancing today show up as the leader tomorrow. Because we have to keep these relationships in harmony. So we say you told the soil, you work with the people, you took the worst of thee prior to, then it's definitely what your role is the day after. But we must communicate to the people in advance these roles so that they can accept this leadership until they have better galvanized their own way of affirming in, in, in their own individual slash collective way. Each individual will affirm as a collective. And I don't mean uh, co-op or, or one of them kibbutzes or socialism. They say got nothing to do with anything they ever thought of. They ain't never had nothing so harmonious, so there's no such formula in their thought process, so we can't even compare it to, is this capitalism, brother? Is this socialism? What is, is this African So Which one is this? Say, brother, this is something you ain't never seen before. So we just hold it up, but that is the day after. And the primary system that must be in place is the justice system. There must be justice. We have to convene those elders. We've talked about them in the past, about convening those elders in the way of presiding over disputes amongst our people. Take this brother and his sister and 20 or 30 more brothers and sisters like them and let them preside over and let there be another team that enforces the decisions of the elders and that those things be in place and that we give honor and respect to our elders and we give honor to the implementation team that must carry out their authority. And these are things that we must think of while we sitting on the toilet even. In fact, if you just thought about revolution every time you took a shit, we'd win. <laughs> now, I don't mean to say that negatively, but I'm saying many people sit on the toilet. They just, here they go, here they go. They sit on the toilet. They just sit there. Now, here's a time when you're all alone. Don't nobody want to hang with you when you Google. <laughs> so if anything, you know you got concentration time. <laughs> That's all my best information. I thought I was sitting on the toilet. I Google a lot. I a lot of fruits and vegetables and stuff. But the point of it is, is that that is the private moment. You can think of a lot of very profound things just while you on the shitter. I mean, really, this is a... And so, if, if, you, if you thought about the revolution no other time, but that put a little pad by your toilet next to the toilet paper or something. A little, little something where, you know, where you can keep... Count the score while you're sitting down. Uh, think of something that you saw you want to relate to another person about the revolution that's coming in. These are the moments. And, uh, you know, and, and so there are moments when we eat and moments when we, uh, when we uh, boo boy and, and, and we should talk to our lovers about the revolution. A revolution should be between lovers, not in lieu of lovers. Sometimes there's a conflict in the home as to whether brother or whether sister go hang with the revolution or make love. And there must be a way that you're doing so good in the revolution that even the love you make is better because you're so, you're so harmonious and you're so on top of your feelings that even your relationship with another person works better because you feel more wholesome and a part of what's going on. And so, uh, 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 in the bed, talk about it in the bed. Hey, hey, what's, what's up? Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the white socks. Oh, man, I'm sorry. Is it over yet? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, everything we think about should go towards that. There's nothing else going on. The house know it'll be paid for when you win. The car know it's yours when it's no one to pay for it. You ain't got to pay, uh, what's the name? Uh, Cal Murchison or whatever the guy's name is. Be sell, yeah, be selling. Can you just get his car and he's gone? It's over. So we be conscious of that. Last thing about the revolution part is time plan. There ain't but four 90-day periods in a year. Four 90-day periods. You ought to at least be able to see your operations in 90-day periods. There are three 30-day periods in each 90-day period. Now, all we're now is just talking about model. I've understood that our inability of our people to plan 
to plan, P-L-A-N, plan. You want to plan that. You got to plan on the plan that. So our, be, our inability of our people to plan is to have a model for thinking in advance. The best chess player usually wins when he can think in advance, to think through consequences, action, reaction, action. So we agree that there's four 90-day periods, and there are three 30-day periods in each 90-day period, and in there you ought to be able to see that if you raise the information on the 30 days, and you had the meetings on the next 30 days, and did the action on the next 30 days, you got one 90-day set completed. In the future, we'll talk a little bit more about what to put in each 90 day. What should happen? What should be accomplished? And how many 90 days we got before it should be up? And we don't have forever to revolt because the enemy has a clock yes. that they're working off of. And because they're dominating at this moment, food, housing, uh, 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 clothing, uh, uh, etc., electronics, then their plan is just as important as ours. So sometimes our plan is pushed up or behind. Now when it gets metaphysically, spiritually, morally, and righteously in sync now, when that clock is set, then don't nothing break the alarm. It's, it's locked in. But we got to get to the lock in moment where it's locked in. We believe now very comfortably that if it ever broke out and we bum rushed them, we got them. We got them. But how do we keep those others from coming back and taking it back for him becomes the equation of success. And that's where the righteousness comes in because we make a case. And by making the case, the others have to back up unless it's just straight down world revolution and we got them outnumbered. Mm -hmm. So they, they just want to start everybody all at once. They're loose. They can't hold Australia if brothers there go at them while brothers in South Africa going at them while brothers in France and other places locked up in the caves of Europe go at them and the brothers in Alaska and in the military and the brothers in Canada in exile and the brothers in Mexico with the brown brother. If we bum rush them, we got him. He cannot win without us. Now, leadership does not plan to be without the enemy. Make the revolution fun, lock in and lock out. More spiritual power. And so uh, that's just a little discussion about the revolution. I need to ask you all, you all want to break for a few minutes now? You want to keep going? Okay, now what time is it now? Now, 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 now I'm telling you, let's do this here. Watch this here. One, watch this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, no, fourteen empty chairs. Now, I guarantee you, when we come back from this break, there'll be more empty chairs than 14. Because the break becomes the breakout. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like that Copley, but I can't hear that revolution shit too long. It's just, it's just little, hey. You know how they get, they get, they get. You hear that other stuff so much, all I want to do is go home and see Jamal, Jamal on the, what do they call me boy name? Huxable boy or something. He on TV tonight. Kai <laughs> LaBelle or something. It's always something to make us want to go do something else. Uh, in the second half, we're going to talk about the boule. we got very important information about boule. I was attacked by the sister who heads ASCAC, uh, Sister Nzinga Ratabisha, uh, in Atlanta last weekend for organizing the attack on the boule that I have around the country. And she mentioned that she had gone to the boule meeting here in LA at the St. Bonaventure Hotel, and that she wanted to let me know that we needed to leave these boule people alone uh, also, uh, she uh, spoke on some other things that you'll need to hear. I want to read a memo to you that went to uh, KPFK in regards to securing a tape where I talked about FEMA, Cecil Murray, and the rebellion on. Uh, we need to talk about the fingering of the CIA. I want to show you how they're targeting the youth. You remember the story that the, that the nation did in the final call about the great computer, G-R-E-A-T, which was fingering the youth? as being part of a gang even if only they dressed a certain way. Right. Well, we're going to talk about the fingering of the youth since the youth is articulated as our essence of a rebellion. Why those youth are being targeted very subtly now, overtly and covertly. And we're going to talk about the youth and we also got to talk about revolution and record sales because we got to come to some conclusion about people who make a lot of money espousing the black thing but once under attack they melt and become just record artists. And uh, Ice T, Sister Soldier, I went through it with Public Enemy and Professor Griff. So I understand uh, what happens when you're making a lot of money and you think that you're not going to make it without the money, so you maintain the relationship even at the expense of dissing the revolution that you use to make the money with. 
And so we have a standard for the revolution. We're not going to let anybody just keep and grabbing it and protesting it. And, and, and we want a standard that the people who talk about it at least mean it. And uh, I talked about my brother, uh, Brother Mike McGee, who really wanted an African Revolutionary Army and then started to lose his election and threw the army away and became a city council person and lost the election. And he lost the election because he gave up the people. And so then he disbanded the army. He told the people that if he lost the election, that he would want to revolt all over Milwaukee. Well, when he lost, he told the people no violence and be cool and the army's gone now. And they put it on 60 Minutes. They put it in all the media. So very well, I remember that old 65-year-old. I should say, I remember our elder of 65 who had the black fatigues on and said, I'm, I've been waiting on some revolution. But well, where is she now? And what happens when we work our people up and don't bring them on home? Right. And so as much as I love brother, he dropped the black revolutionary model. And we don't want any more picking it up. As much as I love the brother, I have to bump him for picking up the revolution and then putting it down for personal expediency. Yeah. And that can't be tolerated. I hope during the break that you all come up here and buy all these tapes. I, I got a lot of tapes up here and I really appreciate your support. Um, uh, I need your support uh, for you all I got uh, to help me to do what I do. And uh, I remember uh, I talked with Brother Collard last uh, weekend, and the Brother Collard and the brothers uh, in the laborers in Chicago uh, were the first brothers to help me when I lost a job for having the first anti-Columbus day uh, back in 1985. And I remember the brothers getting together and pitched in $400 so I could pay my rent. Uh, because I had uh, lost the job uh, in embarrassment and the college was the brothers that got the brothers together. And uh, interestingly enough, we were there last weekend and I said, college, you remember what you told me when you gave me that money? You said, yeah, brother, you got to buy some clothes, but you got to clean up them gym shoes, man, them pants. And, and, it, and at that moment, I was looking real raggedy and he, was, he had some beautiful clothes on. And I said, look at me, college, all these years later, bro, I still ain't got no clothes. Yeah. And uh, we laughed, you know, and uh, he said, but you made it, though. And that was what is important is that it saw me through. And uh, I know days uh, when the minister called the white people off of me. The moments they were attacking me, and he said, get up off of the brother. And they went away. And so we know those moments that gave me a chance to fix my legs after they had broken them. Give me a chance to stand up right. And since they even reawoke me, uh, we have given some of our greatest work in adversity. So... Uh, we want to keep the well going, and I say honestly, I'm having trouble with people bootlegging the tapes, selling the tapes without giving compensation. And it's hard to look at a brother like me and see what I'm doing and see what we're trying to do and you catch all the hell we catch for doing this because God knows a bunch of people don't like me. Not because I ain't good or bad, it's because what I do will cause them problems. And so I get a lot of stuff you don't see. Uh, especially from my own people like I was attacked and fronted last weekend uh, because uh, nobody really wants us to win the thing because we'll bust up some people's good things which is when you look at it it's no thing at all you know but they right now uh, they're in control because their daddy's winning and that's good as long as he's winning so uh, please uh, the bootleggers tell them to send me some money for the tapes it's just unfair for someone to sell the work without buying the information they don't they don't take the time to put it together in deprivation to my own children and sister to have to spend the time to do the work and drag the brothers around who pay for the gas and without compensation and carry me around to the grocery store even all the little things you don't ever see that the brothers make themselves responsible for so that I have the chance to get in the batter's box and get the ball and those people may say, boy, that Coco sure did a good job. I'm really a culmination of a lot of people's efforts, most unrewarded. And I'm proud to have brothers and sisters to help and uh, help me along. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, I, I don't know if it was Brother Collin or someone asked me, what did I think of, uh, what did I think of uh, Brother who's running for president uh, from Youngstown, Ohio, Daniels. Brother Daniels? And I say, you know, he's a good guy. I really like Ron Daniels. He's a really good brother. But as a man, he hadn't developed a group of men to help him accomplish his goal. Mm -hmm. So it's like saying, I like Brother Minister, but in him I see the ability to get groups of men and women to actualize the goals that have been pro pro prophesied. And so it isn't just whether a man understands where his goal is, 
but can he put the combinations together to make the goal come about? And that was a brother I felt had a valid dream to be president, and he really knows the issues, but he doesn't have the character as a man to get groups of men to assist him in his task. Therefore, the task will remain uncompleted. And it's just an honest statement we give testament to each other about can a person put together the vision that they say? He said, Coco, we're talking about that revolution, but can this thing come about? Mm -hmm. They're heading their bets. Opposition has their bet. Well, we won't attack them. Nobody know you out there. 50 people was at that little lecture in Pasadena. They ain't really listening to him. But then they look up and the little people attack them when they say, so Brother Kofi said, you really wasn't doing this right. And we then they jump back at him and the people make a move and they say, one of us inspiring those people say, but we moving on the tapes and say, we know the combination now. And other people say, I think we better stop that Brother Coakley now. I think they're starting to listen. And so they're changing their reaction to me based upon your reaction with me. And so that's all right because we're doing good work and we'll only get a righteous karma. But uh, we know now they have changed their evaluation and uh, they're coming up to do a little boxing. And we want to hit them hard, hit them strong so that they can jump out the ring early. We can save our strength for the final moment. So uh, I hope uh, on this uh, intermission, I guess it'll be about 10, 15 minutes. Whatever, about 10 minutes. Let's just do it in 10 minutes. Uh, now, how many empty chairs do we have? Let's see how many we have in 10 minutes. Now there's, there's one portion of the meeting that I omitted to do. Got everybody's attention now? That is the charity portion. I didn't do that at the beginning. I intended to do it at the beginning, but I didn't. I wanted to hurry and get brother on. So I want to take this opportunity to ask you to be charitable. So there will be, can I get you to help me with the charity? There will be a sister that will pass the bucket. So what you can give, we don't want to rally, you know, we don't want to say who got a hundred and who got this and that. But what you can uh, help us by giving, please give. And then we'll just continue with Brother Steve, because I know you all ready to get to, you know, the, the, the other part of that meal, you know. And how's the food? Is the food okay? Okay, so, well, well you know, that's... Shabazz Cafe, and then, you know, I had a few pies, you know, and I have to plug for myself. Afterwards, you just might want to take a pie home for tomorrow or later. You might want to have a pie nightcap. I don't know. <laughs> but if that's the case, you can do that. <laughs> you can do that. I have assorted flavors. I have assorted flavors. And you sample my wares, so I think you can figure if you care or not, okay? But please give at this point. So, sister's here with the basket. One thing I can say about Brother Steve, he brings a wealth of information. I mean, not only in his mind, but he brings it literally too. It's so here. Step on it too. <laughs> so you step on it. So it's here. Right. No, I don't want to step on it. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> you just say you have it here, brother. You got it. So how many of us learned something new tonight? Anybody learn something new? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's the consensus. All right. Well, if you learn something new, you live it. If you didn't learn anything new, you just decaying. And we don't need to decay. You know, we need to keep on growing. Mm -hmm. So once again, I want to invite you out. Wednesday evenings, Friday evenings, 7.30. And we, we're here two hours. You know, we might have a video presentation, or you might get to hear Brother Kenneth, yours truly, deliver a lecture, you know, some of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Brother Louis Farrakhan. On Friday evening, we have a study circle, and we just 
you know, we have a series of study guides that were given to us by Minister Louis Farrakhan uh, that stem from the speech entitled Self-Improvement, the Basis for Community Development. And we take the study guides and dissect them and we, you know, share our views with each other and feed each other on, on these issues and try to civilize ourselves and, and make self-improvement, you know. So that's what we do. And then Sunday we meet in Los Angeles. So that's 45 or 6 Southwestern. So if you want to come to Los Angeles tomorrow, you're welcome. <coughs> okay, so I want to thank you all for what you have given. And at this point, anybody want to make a comment? Ah, that was a trick question, huh? Nobody has a comment. So, so y'all recognize y'all being taught, huh? So, so we want to just listen, huh? Okay, my brother's getting him a drink, so I'm going to let brother get a drink. But, you know, it's, it's really something because we don't give the due respect that we should to the heroes that are in our midst because we have a way of devaluing each other because we've been trained to do that so well as black people. Right. And, you know, I'm just your brother, not trying to say you're supposed to see me in some kind of light, but just, you know, each of us are children of God, you know, and like in the Bible it says, you are all God's children of the Most High God. Now many of us say, ain't no God in me. You know, I'd rather imagine some God that I could never see than to see a God in me. But in reality, all of us have the God power. It's just we manifest it in different ways. And we have to start appreciating the gift that brothers and sisters have because we are only supposed to compliment the gift, not try to derail the gift or destroy the gift or be envious and jealous of the gift. We should always try to bolster those who are in our midst that have something to give so that they will feel encouraged because when a person is a speaker, they need to be fed too. You know, they may get up here and say whatever it is they say and you might say, wow, wow, then who do they feed off of? That's right. You know, and when it's a real communication, then they get fed. You know, because a true teacher, he enjoys what he does. Any true person that does whatever it is they do, they really like doing it, whatever it is. And that's what makes them successful in doing it because they get a joy out of doing it. So, without any further delay, we're going to bring back our brother. And I know you got your thinking caps on, so you might want to readjust the same thing <laughs> way, but, you know, here is brother. Now, let you. I appreciate our brother's uh, context. And uh, all of us uh, have a great value uh, in our community. Even the enemy has value. Uh, it brings out the best and the good people. And so we be thankful for adversity. Uh, for it only builds character. It's like uh, you lift weights. You know, you're building a force against your force. And the ability to keep lifting it expands your muscle capability. And so uh, that's done with force on force and uh, that builds muscles. So we be into the process of uh, training and expansion. And uh, I really appreciate uh, you all sticking. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 27, over 14. Check. Some of them give water. Well, we'll deduct. You be responsible for deductions. <laughs> and, uh, 27, you can take it on down. And we'll see uh, how we make up. And some of the people that uh, left uh, did come up and uh, buy tapes and say, well, brother, I'm going to be one of them ones. And, uh, and I know everybody does the best that they can. I appreciate them coming. Uh, I appreciate uh, Brother Lawrence and other brothers providing the opportunity. And uh, for the people that did came and left, they still paid the same amount uh, as the person that will stay to the very end. So we appreciate their support. And I know I appreciate the support. Uh, I pre appreciate the support uh, from the brothers here, the support to me and my family. We appreciate that. And uh, that's an honorable moment to be appreciated. And so it's in that context that we do the best that we can. Uh, in the middle of all of this, uh, sometimes we don't rub each other a little raw. There's even conflict in the family. Uh, it's part of the nurturing and growing process. We just, when we fall 
in disagreement in the moment. We just don't want to fall out with each other. We just keep our disagreements within manageable limits like the enemy has been able to do on the question of us. They have always been able to find unity uh, without uh, adversity when it comes to the Negro problem. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we don't want to fall out. So uh, we always understand that disagreement is manageable. And uh, sometimes to get the perfection, uh, we uh, call upon good to be excellent. We call upon fair to be good. We call upon failing to be poor, at least. And so there's always this going up process or pulling on one to be better than they are. And that be an amiable goal uh, for our relationship with each other. Uh, during this uh, moment, uh, I want to make sure I spend some time talking about the boule. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about KPFK and the mysterious memorandum. Mm. We're going to talk a little bit about the intelligence community and these two, three books right here. Uh, one, the question of intelligence community. My sister asked uh, during the intermission, she said, Brother, you talk as if I know what the Council on Foreign Relations is, and I don't. And uh, that makes sense because that would give her an unfair opportunity to understand what Jesse Jackson was doing and was not doing when he was dancing around the question of the Council on Foreign Relations. And so I gave Sister the same tape that I gave the sister that fell out of the chair for she exposed herself as needing it. <laughs> and so that she would be able to go away and pull herself up to that lesson. But I just need to say for those who don't understand it is that the Council on Foreign Relations is in most of the major cities of this country and there is where the rich and powerful galvanize and derive consensuses about what they will do around the world. What is done in Latin America is derived of a consensus from the wealthy families in the various cities and their higher-ons, their professors, their nuclear physicists, their uh, think tankers, uh, their investment bankers, these people, the operators, carry out for the owners the willpower, will direction of the owners. And the Council on Foreign Relations is an extension of a secret society. There's a tape over there called Rhodes Rothschild Secret Society. Can a black man be a Rhodes Scholar? The Rhodes Scholar Conspiracy, as well as a tape on the Council on Foreign Relations. In fact, in almost every single tape up there, there is some mention of the secret society because everything serves it. There is no deviation in the white world as to who is in control. And so the Council on Foreign Relations is an extension of this secret society. It is the outer circle to an inner circle of secret societies. And the outer circle would be this rubber band and my fingers would be the individuals. And these individuals are protected by the outer context of what's called an association of helpers. This association of helpers includes the money people, the investment bankers, the commercial bankers, the uh, 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 what's left of the savings and loan. It also includes the university system or the educational system. It also includes the all the corporate structure, the oil, the food, the gas, the light. Uh, it includes the political apparatus, the union apparatus, the the uh, Negro leadership connection, uh, the foundations, the think tanks. All of those institutions are the outer circle to a group of individuals who control the world. Interestingly enough, we have talked for a long time about Professor Carol Quigley. Professor Carol Quigley is the author of a book called The Anglo-American Establishment. And what Carol Quigley did in his book Tragedy and Hope and Anglo-American Establishment is that he more than anybody fingered the people who were involved in the secret society. And uh, did I get my uh, report back on the ADL? Somebody out there? Okay, don't forget to get back in the CFR. Is that still floating around? Okay, don't, for, don't let me forget to get it. Uh, on my last trip, someone took my boule book with all of the names in it. And it was... Who has it? He has... No, he has the Boule book, the journal. He has, he doesn't have the journal. I think he just has the Boule book that I lent him, uh, which is the black book right here. He took that one. I don't think he has the journal. You do. Uh, okay.
Uh, and so, um, uh, quickly, better than anybody, fingered these people. And so, uh, when uh, Clinton gave his acceptance speech uh, at the Democratic Convention, uh, he mentioned Carol Quigley. And this is a very monumental moment that he give credibility to the source of our discussion about the secret society. See, someone will say then, well, brother, you quote this book of Carol Quigley, Tragedy and Hope. And uh, the uh, Anglo-American establishment, uh, how credible is Quigley? And we know that Quigley taught at Harvard and Princeton and Georgetown. So for the white people, that's about as credible as they could get. And so we give credence to that level of credibility. Uh, also, uh, we want to draw attention to, and here are the covers. I brought the covers at least. I think I left the Clinton article. This is the cover of the book. I know Esselwine sells the book. Uh, there are others who sell this book, Anglo-American Establishment. And as you can see, it's the British Union Jack with the United States flag inside. And it's just like the outer circle is the British flag and the inner circle is the individuals or the U.S. connection. But in symbolism, uh, that is correct about the nation state. Uh, but the professor as a source, as a source, uh, he wrote a book exposing that the Rhodes Scholars and this network is the upper level of a secret society. He's quoted in none that call it conspiracy, the Rockefeller file, the naked capitalist, the invisible government. Everybody quotes Carol Quigley as the source of knowledge of the secret society because he worked in the secret society and had the privilege of having access to all of his secret papers. He was not adverse to its goal, which was to conquer the world and all people of color. He was only adverse to its methods and its desire to remain secret. And so he was the only to write about it of credible nature. And uh, when Clinton gave his acceptance speech, in the next to last paragraph, he gives honor to his professor at Georgetown, Carol Quigley, who steered him on the path, which of course led him to Oxford to be a Rhodes Scholar. And I was very disappointed when Sister Soldier had the opportunity to call Clinton the essence of what he is. And she said he played golf at the White Company, and he had sex with another woman other than his wife, and uh, he inhaled while he was at Oxford. But those are not the most important things that he's done against us. It's his relationship as a member of the Rhodes Scholars, who are paid in the trust of Cecil Rhodes, who sought to colonize all of Africa. For that, he will pay us forever. He's also a member of Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission, which is a sister organization to the CFR, or Council on Foreign Relations. And we would have been good to blame him for that. The sisters on every single television show, every, most radio stations, it would, it would work. Somebody back there farting, I heard it. <laughs> uh, uh, if you are, see again, if you are producing a song called We Are At War, that's the name of the song that got her in some of the trouble, allegedly, then you should have known who you were at war against. You can't be uh, mouthing off the revolution and not know who the revolt is against. And if you listen carefully to your community, your community knows who has the answers to the questions. So you seek out the knowledge from those who are fit to stand where they can. And so uh, then again, if you work for Sony, and the head of Sony, Akita Morita, is a founding member of the Japanese section of the Trilateral Commission, and your desire is to prove to Sony that revolutionary rap sells and makes profit, then you might not bring up Trilateral because you understand that your boss, like Clinton, tolls the same line, and your relationship is to make records and not revolution, for which you will never be paid for by whites. So, so, so under that context, record sales over revolution. Ice T. Here, his brother got a song out called "Cop Killer." It's not really a rap; it's rock. And he's playing. He admits that 85% of the rap is bought by white children, which might have something to do why they're more willing to hang out on that set to make a sale in a group of people they might not reach under normal circumstances. Because we know we can reach each other because the minister reached all of y'all with no publicity at all. They didn't start putting him in 
the papers until 84 in the presidential thing when he went down to register with Jesse. But up until then, he built a whole nation with no TV, no radio. Marcus Garvey had one million strong with no TV and no radio. So we know we can reach each other. It's the whites. Now, see, I have a problem with this. This is, uh, I have a problem with this. That sister soldier interviewed in Playboy magazine. I don't believe that we read the magazine enough for the words to be for us. So the words were for the European. And I don't believe we owe them dialogue. We will mystify them about our superior strength when we walk past them in solidarity and say, there's no need to educate the ignorant. We only dealing with our own. That's a lockout. See, we're talking about putting a lockout together, not a lock-in. This is locking in. We locking out. And so it says, sister soldier speaks her mind all over the white woman panties. And I want to remind sister of history. Malcolm X died as soon as he did his interview with Alex Haley in Playboy. Right. Martin King died as soon as he did his interview right. with Alex Haley in Playboy. Norman Rockwell, the right-wing Nazi party man, died as soon as he did his interview in Playboy. And I can add up John Lennon. I can call you a whole group of names who died after this stuff. Sister needs to remember the history. The interview she gave in the Washington Post, the interview she gave in the Washington Post that brought about this resurgence around her, which is right here. That's the interview in the Washington Post. Look at that huge picture. Look at that instigating byline. What does the byline say, Brother Maurice? I can't see it. Sister soldiers call to arms. Read the subline. Who's arresting whom? Excuse me. A rapper says the riots were payback. Are you paying attention? See, it's to alert the whites. Are you listening to what they're saying? Are you? Did you hear what she said? Now, this article was written by a guy named David Mills. See, anybody who knows the history and listens to their own people when they talk like she should would have known that she never should talk to to David Mills because David Mills was the one that wrote the original article in 88 that broke public enemy up he is persona non grata in our community at that time he worked for the Washington Times he now writes for the Washington Post he's been promoted in Professor Griff's first album since the breakup, he has a whole song in here condemning David Mills, who's a black man. And so she walks into Washington, he puts a microphone in her face, and she speaks right into it without any understanding of who she's talking to. And so history repeated itself. And she was then condemned by the same guy who four years earlier caused the breakup of Public Enemy. And he also spoke against me very extensively, very negatively, and I caught him. Uh, in fact, let me just, I'll put that in now while I'm setting something up for you. Uh, David Mills uh, was on the radio. So all the naked white women pictures fall all out just to show you sister soldier thing. I just don't understand who's, who's reading that, that we give our talk to them. Uh, but David Mills got on the radio in Washington, D.C., was the head of the city council as a radio show in Washington. And uh, this was right during the Sister Soldier thing. This guy killed a woman, but I understand. Uh, and so I uh, made sure that uh, I got to talk to Mr. Mills. Uh, and I can correct it by telling people what happened over uh, what he was doing. Um, who's on the Public Enemy. Yes. Uh, here we go, here we go. Who's that on there? Spike Lee and the Malcolm X story? Mm, that's interesting. Y'all better watch that. Oh, very good. Uh, one is, I hear you have a gentleman there named uh, David Mills. Yes, that's me. Uh, is that the same uh, David Mills, uh, whom I guess about in 1988, uh, wrote an article, I believe it was on behalf of the Washington Times at that time, did an interview of uh, Professor Griff. Yes, sir. And at that interview, subsequent to that, uh, 
became extremely controversial. Yes, indeed. And that interview was then redone in the Village Voice, and uh, it became a uh, black Jewish issue. Yep. And uh, subsequent to that, a rift developed between Professor Griff and Public Enemy. Yes. And subsequent to that, I believe Professor Griff did an album called Pawns in the Game, of which there is a song on there about you stating that because of the activity that you had done at the Washington Post, it was his perception. Mm -hmm. the Washington Times. Yeah, the Times then. Yeah. Yeah. That, that uh, you were a traitor to black people based upon not only the way you wrote the article, but the inflammatory uh, sub comments made by you. Uh, in fact, uh, some of which were against me, uh, Steve Coakley, who he listed in your interview as the source of his information about the depth of wicked activity transacted by Jewish people in America. This is the same David Mills? Yep. Uh, well, I just... My little brother is hot in the background. It's on the show. It's three rappers, David Mills and the chairman of the city council in Washington, John Wilson. And the one guy, if you listen very carefully, now the role again is to unfold him, not to jump him. Hey man, you jumped on me four years ago, you ain't nothing about that, but to unfold him. In a series of questions, he concurs with everything. It's like an attorney. Is your name Bill Smith? Yes. You know the two of Yes. You say they think it's all real easy. Then you start to lay it down into them after they bid on the line, right? Yes, 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 yes. He's kind of proud of these things. Yes, 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 yes. No. And so you hear the other little brother there say, word. As he now know we didn't caught him. It. He transacted by Jewish people in America. This is the same David Mills? <laughs> yep. Uh, well, I just have to say, brother, as I mentioned last night in a lecture at Howard University, a uh, sister soldier, if she had have studied within her own culture, she would have known that she should have never done the interview with you in the first place because it was known to all of us in the black community that under no circumstances are we to cooperate with you because the values you bring to a dialogue with us continuously seem to be pro-white people. And so it's unfortunate that this situation has escalated because while most of the city is plagued by a discussion over Clinton, Soldier, and Jackson, John Wilson and the mayor and the police chief are out putting roadblocks down across the city, SWAT teams are invading public housing areas, all because some white congressmen and senators, senators insist that if they don't do something quick, they're going to do it and replace or usurp the power of the local elected officials. And I'm kind of worried about, one, the distraction, and Mr. Wilson, too, about the roadblocks and the state of emergency that is still in effect that allows the police to be forced into mandatory overtime to conduct these roadblocks where innocent people are stopped for no other reason than because some white men on the Congress have decided that it be done or that other actions be taken. And I would suggest that if you told them no and appeal to the people that the people, the innocent people who stand to be thrown up against the walls and their pockets checked or who may be playing the rap music and get pulled over by the police on the potential suspicion that rap music must mean drug selling or drug using, that if you ask the people to defend you against the Congress, we would support you. But please don't let them while wow, all of them. I don't think, I, no, I, I don't know what charge is that Mr. Mills, and Mr. Mills can um, speak to that thing. But uh, our city at the present, uh, at the present time, what we're trying to do is stop the senseless killings that are taking place. We are going to, we are going to, we are going to try to confiscate as much drugs or as much guns as we can get our hands on, and no white man or nobody else is telling me to do it. I think we should do it simply because I am tired of watching young people being blown apart over some drugs and over some stupidity. That makes sense. Hundreds of, hundreds of black, there's there, there no white people being killed in this city. These are black, young black people that are being killed. And the police, and, the, and if the police don't crack down on the, on, on, on the situation, 
then we'll, then we'll say that we're letting people raise genocide against our people. What? We can't win either way. Well, but the fact of the matter is, no, I listen to you. You listen to me. I'm now. waiting. Well, can you listen to me for a minute? I'm waiting. The fact of the matter is that what we're doing is cracking down in known drug areas, known areas where people are, are selling drugs, known areas where people are selling weapons, and uh, we're not, and we're putting, and we're putting up barricades and, 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 and traffic barricades in areas where drugs are known to be sold. And I would advise people who are not in that business, who are not, who are not buying those things, not to go in those areas. Well, because you're going to be arrested. Well, there's a lot of cocaine sold in Georgetown. I bet you you won't put up and we roadblocks. Got, we got roadblocks and barricades in Georgetown, too, and we have, we have the same number of people everywhere in this city right now trying to trying to stem the tide of drugs and to stem the tide of people being shot. I would, now, if, you don't want, if you want to say that, of course there's drug use in Georgetown. I don't believe it's a neighborhood in this city where they didn't drug use. Well, I would say this. I would believe you if I wouldn't have remembered when that white man who was chairman or head of the House Bank shot himself in the mouth. And the next day the Congress held a hearing and insinuated that D.C. better quickly do something. And you all passed a law that allowed and it restricted certain rights of people who were picked up who I believe were either ex-felons or had committed felony crimes. No, crime. you're talking about bail reform and that was done way before that occurred. And if he shot himself, he shot himself. I don't know who shot him. Well, that was part of the hysteria that forces you no, into hysteria, a position. No, the hysteria that is forcing us into a position is simply this. And let me make it clear to you. The hysteria that's forcing us into a position is that we are losing over 500 to 600 people a year in senseless murder. And we're trying to figure out how to stop it. And if you got some suggestions as to how to stop it, then I'm willing to listen to those suggestions. But i got to take a break, but I want I'm going to give Mr. Mills a chance to respond to what you raised with him, and then we're going to take a break. And I would, and, and just Let Mr. Mills respond to what, 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 what you said about him. Now or after the... No, go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, uh, I don't see how I did anything... Well, what, Mr. Coakley, what did I do wrong in, in uh, 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 telling the readers of the Washington Times uh, how Professor Griff feels about Jewish people? Those were, those were his feelings. Well, just like your comments about Sister Soldier, you exaggerated them in a way to inflame white people so that they would retaliate or respond against black people, just like the crime hysteria in Washington, D.C., forces the elected overseer to support the master's activity to suppress the innocent that's the problem the innocent are being stopped mr wilson it's the innocent rappers who are hurt mr mills by the exaggerations that you all play back to white people good evening thank you for calling i don't know what you wrote what did you write mr Mills? well uh, professor griff told me that uh, jack jews are responsible for the majority of the wickedness that goes on across the globe the jews are wicked and uh Consequent to our interview and the controversy, uh, he got a solo record deal. He's had two albums out. Uh, Sister Soldier, consequent to talking to me, uh, uh, has become the most popular rapper on, in the is country. Is on the cover of Newsweek. Well, I need to talk to you. Yes. Well, I need to talk to you. Say something. I'm like this, yo. I'm like this in general. See, now he tried to make it like because he exposed them to the whites, they're all very popular. You can ask Griff or Sister Soldier would they rather have it or not have it. They both tell you they would prefer not to have it ha happen. So uh, we're not going to accept just because he scratched them out in front of the white people. That because Griff got a solo record album, he feel better than being with Public Enemy. I don't believe that's true. And so uh, the point is, in fact, uh, it goes on, David Mills thinks about this after the break, he says, uh, and it's on the tape on the other side, uh, if I would be willing to call him, could he talk with me? Because he wouldn't like to see me going around, he wouldn't like to see me going around on college campuses telling everybody that he's a traitor. And he'd like to have an off-the-cuff meeting with no notes being taken of he and I talking so that I could see that he wasn't such a bad guy. And I, the next 10 callers after that is God is my witness, it's on this tape, said, well, Brother Coakley, I hope you don't go meet with him because he didn't ask to respect uh, no meeting with you in 88 when he condemned you in the Public Enemy article. Why now, four years later, when you're putting that heat on his ass, do he want to meet with you now? 
And so all we ever say to them is that uh, we reach them. We reach them and turn to the public and say, here, now comes David Mills. It's a legal term. Now comes David Mills. He has betrayed his people. Let us tell you how he has done it. Mr. Mills, how do you plead? I plead, let me meet you privately and work this out. Plea <laughs> bargain. And we say guilty. No plea bargaining. You get the limit, sucker. And so uh, we draw attention to that. And that would have all been averted if Sister Soldier hadn't talked to him. We were never supposed to talk to him anyway. Uh, Ice T, he has uh, got a cop killer going. Now, Time Warner is the same company that did the uh, JFK movie. There was great pressure on Oliver Stone over the movie, but never once did he pull the movie off because Cyrus Vance or Al Haig or George Bush or any other people in on the killing right. wanted relief because of the danger of the movie. It's now the, in the video sales and stuff. So he didn't have to give up that and Time Warner didn't have to apologize for JFK. Now comes Cop Killer and Ice-T got on Arsenio Hall show two nights before he buckled. And he talked a bunch of shit. I ain't backing down, the police is terrible. He gave him a real big huff and puff. Two days later, he announces that because of the death threats on Time Warner, he's pulled the record. And ahead of Time Warner make 42 million a year. If he can't buy his own security, then it ain't shit Ice-T can do for him. And when asked about the threats that Ice-T brought up as the excuse for pulling cop killer, they said, well, we had one verbal threat on the telephone and one insinuated threat. We're not worried at all over either of them. And Ice-T says it's the police, but we cannot substantiate that. It is this New York Times article, though, dated July 29, 1992, that tells the real story about why he backed down. It was in the meeting with Time Warner when they told him all of the trouble they were having as a result of the record and said, you, brother man, got to do the right thing and announce that you, that you are the one that's giving up. And all of the articles you will see, if I was to show them to you, all of the articles say what the white man needed it to say, which is Ice-T removes the record. Ice-T withdraws cop killer. Ice-T, long as it had his name on it, and it's like this ice tea drops cop killer. As long as his name is on pulling it off, then that was all they needed to save face. And so under the guise of relinquishing the threats against the white corporate structure, the brother calls off the heat. I would much prefer to have two, three time warner people die and other time warner people be afraid and the white police and FBI chased the suspected killers. I would rather have seen that confusion with the white man than the seen brother stop. See, remember what we were looking for. We're looking for anyone who alleges that they gonna stop the violence on the white man. And so we draw attention to that. Record sales over revolution. And having been through it with Public Enemy, where the dialogue became, we are fighting the system, no one in particular. Uh, having seen the isolation of Professor Griff until Luther Campbell picked him up. And then he got condemned for the booty records a year and a half after they had been out, not because of the booty records, but because he helped Griff when the white man said everybody stepped back off of him. And so now here comes Sister Soldier and Ice-T. And I want to say no picture with anybody in anybody's newspaper can relieve them of their responsibility to uphold the revolution. I don't know what's said when they go get those pictures and all put their hands together and look like they're in solidarity with something. As long as they're working for the enemy, they're not in solidarity with me. I tell them to their face. I tell them on the tape. There is a standard to the revolution which was started long before you were born. And you can't come mess it up for no record sales. We guarantee that will not happen. And I have brought a videotape. I see you got a VCR in the back. Uh, if you were dying to have it, what time is it now? 
1115. Uh, we might not get to it this trip, but I have a videotape of Sister Soldier's press conference in Washington, D.C., uh, where she came in and gave an hour's press conference with the press. In fact, on the tape, District in Trouble, which is talking about those roadblocks and things I was jumping on the city council guy for, because in the midst of all this Clinton, uh, Jackson, Sister Soldier hysteria, they was whipping roadblocks down in Washington, and I was not going to let everybody get deceived with the cover stuff. So that Sister Soldier Clinton, all that was cover stuff. When he hit her and she didn't hit him right, I knew it was a stage show. When the record company still up in place, everybody still selling records, I knew it was a front. It was not a legitimate fight at all. Jesse Jackson, just to give you a little history, Jesse Jackson went to New York and met with Sister Soldier because Jesse's two sons asked for her to be in on the Rainbow Coalition meeting. She was one of 21 speakers. She spoke for four minutes. And outside of the greeting and the closing, she didn't say anything. But as soon as she finished, both of Jesse's sons came to the podium and repudiated her for nothing she said that day. They repudiated her for the story. And then, after though both of them repudiated her, then came Clinton, who repudiated her on cue. See, Jesse went to New York to guarantee that she would come, then told Clinton she was coming. Clinton then prepared his attack on her. They then set her up into the podium, put her up there for four little minutes. It took her hours to get there. It took her four minutes to speak. The people that invited her repudiated her. As soon as she finished, then comes Clinton repudiating her. Then comes booped all of the media, the press, and Clinton is shown as a white guy who will beat on black women to be a good president. And other white men say, yes, he'd make a good president. You see him hit that black woman? And sister got sucker punched. And then she announced Jesse Jackson as one of her supporters and Charles Rango. And she goes through, listen, I'm not isolated. All these people are supporting me. And the white man looking up saying, them is my niggas. Don't she know? But in that press conference that next day after the district in trouble tape, they came to me and they said, Sister Soldier's having a secret press conference tomorrow with the press. I said, you can have no secret press conference with the press. Every white man in town is going to be there. And I turned to the audience of 200 and said, tomorrow upstairs, we're at Howard University. I said, tomorrow upstairs, Sister Soldier's having a secret press conference at 1 o'clock. I suggest all you Africans be there. And the Africans came, too. Now, what the importance of that is, is sometimes when the media comes and has a press conference, did anybody from the nation that go with the minister will tell you? Somebody in the press will say, I'm going to ask you some eight ball. Well, uh, how many of the blacks' problems is the blacks' own problem? Well, that's when your crowd goes, uh, and weighs the person away without your person having to speak to it. That's when your audience boos the white people when they ask goofy questions. Your audience threatens the reporters when they start getting antagonistic and you don't like it, and you remind them that to file the story, they got to get out the room. That's why your people in the room with the press. You don't get no cage with no alligator and don't have no pistol. Because you may be taming it, but every now and then he ain't going to want to get up on the thing and go arp, arp. <laughs> so to make it come right, that's why you have your tools in the room with you. Uh, and so uh, there's mistakes that are being made. And we understand that. But we want the mistakes to be composite with the rap. And so don't bite off the whole thing and say you only really had half a stomach for that to cause a little vomit. And so uh, we are keeping this thing in order. This thing is out of, we're gonna have a righteous revolution and ain't nobody gonna mess it up. Check. Check. And so they set the sister up and uh, well, we hope the sister does better. Uh, in the press conference, in the tape that I have with me, they asked the sister, why do you talk to the white press? And she says, I talk to the white press because our people are fixated on the white people and the only way to reach our people is through the white people. And then the brother says, ah, sister, that's not. She says, well, that's my answer. And uh, we know that's not a legitimate answer. We don't need the white people. No. We no. don't need no. to talk through them whatsoever. Nothing. The final call will reach all the black people you can handle, sister. You don't need, you don't need no white man's Playboy magazine. Don't have one sister in the whole magazine. Not that we want to see her body, but they ain't no sister writers either. In fact, if you go back to Playboy, if you can find one sister ever wrote for Playboy, not been naked, you ain't gonna find but one a year naked. There's usually one black woman a year naked, but you won't find one black woman ever having wrote for it. Uh, you'll get the impression about why do we give credence to the incredible. 
and uh, that magazine has never been in any support of anything of ours, so uh, we don't quite get it. Also, there was another question in there. Uh, sister says, I want to let you know that in no way do I support an armed struggle against the white race in America, for an armed struggle would be suicide. And the insinuation that I'd like to overthrow the white government is causing personal jeopardy to my safety. And I want you all to know that I would not be an advocate of any such thing. And again, I say that if the violence or the threat or hitting the white man won't work, then show me the plan that you thought of that exposed that as an unvalid tactic. In the absence of the plan, you're given conclusion on something that you haven't studied which is conspiratorial, at least, seeing that you gave a conclusion, didn't have no backup evidence. You just concluded on your own. And, then, and whether you're in jeopardy or not, got nothing to do with whether you're going to revolt. We are all in jeopardy, whether we voice revolution or not. He doesn't deviate between whether you're in on it or not. He said, come over here, nigga. That's all it takes. He look at you. That's enough. He look at you. You don't differentiate. He don't say, is you Miss Daisy Driver? Right. He'll hit you and say, oh, you drive for Miss Daisy? Right. Check. So uh, we're not going to go for that. And so uh, we'll just talk about that another time. Ice tea withdraws cop killer. Again, to give safety to big white rap record executives. But this is the key. When rock is slowly fading as taste and music go off in many directions, technology change increases the choices while rap claims protest market. Rap music is replacing rock music as the alternative for young white children. The big whites who are losing money on rap and the promotions and the creating the guitars and all the things that the rappers don't need I now have a desire to bust rap up as an economic consequence. And so the youth not only created their own industry, created their own money, got support of whites to distribute their records, but now the whites have decided that they're making too much money. In fact, Brother Ed just showed me an article where they're attacking a specific rapper, saying he incited a specific level of violence. Tupac. Tupac, really Tupac, Tupac Shakur. Yeah, Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur. So the consequences on the rappers are increasing. Rappers chant a refrain of hate. This is the Jewish community giving their statement nationwide on rap only a week before the David Mills did the article on Sister Soldier. So the setting up of them to eliminate them as a power group is evident because the targeting of the youth is what the CIA has done and by targeting the youth the rappers are in the vanguard of youth consciousness and I really appreciate what Sister Soldier has done I appreciate Ice-T, I appreciate Public Enemy they are very good fighters uh, but we, I want them to go to the end we want them to know that the end means all the time and we never give up the struggle not even for a minute Anyway, we'll move on from there. I think you understand the point. Uh, now, um, something else I want to mention uh, here I think is uh, validly important. Uh, earlier we talked about the early warning officer and stuff and uh, Jackson and uh, how all that works. Uh, be conscious of it. Uh, there's a display going around. Let me just show you this. Uh, this is an article on a display that's going around in a book called Build to Bridges or Bridges to Build or something. It's put out by the Jewish Magazine, the Jewish Museum of New York, supported by the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Field Foundation, the Robertson Foundation, the Sloan Kettering Foundation, the somebody else I'm missing. And it's a rehash of a story done against me in Esquire Magazine in May of 89. It's got about seven or eight stories in it. It sells for $25 and it's a museum display that's at the Jewish Museum in New York. It's soon coming to San Francisco, Chicago, New Orleans, uh, Atlanta. And we're preparing for it moving around. It's an anti-black Jewish museum display that's being run through the Jewish Museum, financed by all the major white corporations. I know in the story on me it condemns the minister, the Hebrew Israelites, uh, the uh, see, Hebrew Israelites, the nation, myself. And the uh, place of the Jewish people real big is done by Taylor Branch, who did part in the waters. But keep your eye on that. Uh, bridges to uh, build bridges, and whatever that is, something like that. You, yep. This is imagery. It's good imagery. It's just decide, uh, uh, deceptive. 
uh, uh, now. And in case you don't know what guns do, you can see it was a pistol they got P-Rod out that election. P-Rod, known as parole to others, uh, was uh, got out of the race when he was winning because Bush told him they would shoot him if he didn't. <laughs> and so without any valid excuse whatsoever, he vacated the political premises. Now he's inching back trying to see if he can touch it without getting burned. Uh, but uh, many of the whites gave up on him because they know he lacked the courage to fight it out to the end. And uh, obviously Clinton's in to the end. And uh, that was a major, uh, major discussion. Ah, let me just skip every, let me just go right to some points and move on. Uh, this book here uh, is the uh, book that Coin and Telpro came out of. This is the Senate Intelligence Committee hearing on the uh, CIA, FBI, and all of that. This is what's called the Church Committee hearings for the Senate uh, Special Committee to Investigate Intelligence, something like that. But they had something here in the back that was not as well known as Coin and Tell Pro. It was called the Ghetto Informant Program. And the Ghetto Informant Program mentioned that in 72 they had over 7,000 informants in the black community and the only qualification for the informant to get paid was that he had to live in the ghetto. Now, if there were 7,227 informants, uh, think of 50 states, 10 cities in every state where we got friends. Think about how many per state you can put when you got 7,000 to work with. And since they have to live in the black community to be a part of it, just think of how deep uh, that intelligence section goes. Uh, this is mentioned in the three tapes that I did on intelligence, the future of the spy system, spy system 2000, and group analysis, group uh, network analysis. 140 in every state. 140 in every state. That means if you've got uh, 10 major cities with blacks, you can get 14 in a city. And uh, considering that uh, some cities don't have but 20, 30, 40 more than 14, you might can only use one in that city and send 14 more up to Chicago or 14 more into uh, Atlanta or 14 more into LA because you've got this excess uh, of uh, informants. It's only to draw attention to the fact that uh, to get to the ones that we're after in the revolution, we're going to have to beat the OEO boys. The OEO boys are the intelligence community. And uh, that's why we did those tapes so late in the day, having talked about the counterintelligence, which is how they act against us, we need to describe who it was that is acting against us, in specific by job title. Uh, now I just want to mention two things uh, before we wrap up here tonight, uh, the Boule and these two books. Uh, I did a lecture on this book in which I talk about this book and this book. Hmm? Behold a Pale Horse. Uh, both of these books are extremely dangerous. I find them more dangerous than I find them helpful. But there are some very good things that are in the book. Uh, the section in uh, uh, Cooper's book that deals with the National Security Council and the National Security Directors, 5410 uh, uh, and others. Uh, the 40 Group, the 40 Committee, the MJ-12, the Jason Society, the Jason Group. There's a section in here that is excellent. Important thing he mentions in that section is talking about the right of the president to write legislation called a national security directive and identify a threat without ever having to communicate it to the Congress or to the citizenship. In other words, we know from Brother Tom Mitchell who worked in the CIA, who we used to speak at Savior's Days together on counterintelligence, that the number one program in CIA is to stop the God is black. The point of that was that there was no greater crime for the CIA than what's called heresy or the misappropriation of the white God force. And that was a dramatic uh, development to know that they work at the Jesus is white, God is white symbolism. That's a, that's a cornerstone in the CIA's responsibility to uphold the white races built upon their identity with a God figure of which there is no known sighting. <laughs> but that's alien. We're talking about that's real alien. Uh, but that chapter is excellent. Uh, he also uh, has another chapter in here about FEMA, H.R. 4079, which has very valid information warning us about FEMA and other things. He specifically identifies the corresponding legislation 
I think it's good. I think Coakley on FEMA 1, 2, and 3 is better though. <laughs> he has another chapter in here about the secret government, but very dangerously calls it a hypothesis. He gives a lot of detailed information in this chapter, but he qualifies it by saying that uh, uh, perspective. Since some of this information was derived from sources that I cannot divulge for obvious reasons and from public sources which I cannot vouch for, this chapter must be termed a hypothesis. I firmly believe that if aliens are real, this is the true nature of the beast. Now, we are in the pursuit of the beast. He comes up and says that the alien is the beast. Now, what does that do when we hide in pursuit of Rockefeller? Chandler, uh, DuPonts, the Crows, the, the Fields, and here we go almost ready to catch them. And somebody walks up and says, no, not him, over there. <laughs> you mean after 400 years of tracking down this group? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold these ones right here. <laughs> and if they want to come and help them, then we'll wait for them here. But I'm going to tie this horse down. I done already caught it. He says that it is not only a scenario that has been able to bind all the diverse elements, it is the only scenario that answers all the questions and the places, the various fundamental mysteries in an area that makes sense. It is the only explanation that shows the chronology of events and demonstrates that the chronologies when assembled match perfectly. The bulk of this I believe to be true. The bulk of this I believe to be true. Then what part do you believe is not true? because you don't distinguish what you believe and don't believe during the chapter. You only preface it at the beginning of the chapter, which means that he could pick any part of it when challenged and say, well, that's the part I said I didn't believe in. Uh, the bulk of this I believe to be true if the, the material that I viewed in the Navy is authentic. As for the rest of it, I do not know. That is why this paper must be termed a hypothesis. Most historic and current available evidence supports this hypothesis. Uh, then goes on to talk about the National Security Council, which he says was started to create and oversee the alien question. In that case, the aliens must be black people because the National Security Council was organized to, to unify the intelligence community around the uh, containment of the people of color. So maybe we are alien to him. Uh, then goes on to say something I think is a very interesting, uh, we wouldn't want to miss. He uh, says that President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. Great difficulty was encountered in maintaining international secrecy. It was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments, scrutiny of governments by the press. This was the formulation of the secret ruling body which became known as the Bilderberger Group. That is absolutely false. He then says, what he's saying now, he, the chapter starts with about Truman and the alien question. Now, if you know anything about the oppressor's English, your opening paragraph is to tell you the subject for the rest of the paragraph, your opening sentence. So our opening sentence deals with Truman and the developing alien problem. But he interjects in that something totally different and says it was decided that an outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international efforts in order to hide the secret doesn't say in the sentence what the secret is, which means it must be the earlier moment. So now he's saying that the Bilderberger group was started to be able to keep secret the alien question. That is not true. If you call the Bilderberger out as a response to the aliens and you don't understand how the CFR, the Bilderberger, and the trilateral fit in the evolving relationship of whites coming up with a leadership structure to govern their material world, he says the result was the formulation of the secret ruling body which became known as the Bilderberger Group. The group was formed and met for the first time in 52. He says the Bilderberger's headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland. The Bilderberger's evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. 
The United Nations was then and is now an international joke. That is absolutely false. Because if the Bilderberger is to control the world, then you can't separate the UN, which is its implementation arm. But you'll never make it to the Bilderberger meeting because there's thousands of police. You could go to the United Nations. So he tells you the Bilderberger runs it all and the United Nations ain't shit. Which means, again, if you're pursuing the enemy, he is wiping out the track of the level of enemy that you can reach. And so planning that with another enemy that you'll never get near is suffer at the end. That's part of the deception. I will tell you that Bill Cooper still works for the police. He is still the police. I'm telling you for a fact, he is still the police. Furthermore, he says, and I think it's uh, just, well, man, this will, this will knock you over, and I don't want to miss it. Uh, uh, page three. This is something uh, when you measure how you should let a person around the black community, you measure it against what their overall goals are. Now, what is his overall goals and value system vis-a-vis -vis mine? And if we both talk in the same stuff, what's the difference in the two of us? Just for example, this is page three in the introduction called This Is My Creed. One, I believe Uh, one, I believe first in God, the same God in which my ancestors believed, and I believe in Jesus Christ and that he is my savior. Well, who is God and who is the God of his ancestor? You think he got woolly hair? Lamb's wool connection? Is that the God of his father? Is it? Come on now, you need to tell me because uh, now we understand that on the first fundamental essence of his existence, his creed, we disagree. He believes in the God of his father, the big white God, and I think that that's blasphemy. His second belief is, second, I believe in the Constitution of the Republic of the United States of America without interpretation as it was written and meant to work. Well, we know that the 56 Mason boys wrote the Constitution. We know that the Mason boys cannot be overstated in their relationship in controlling it, formulating it, and defending it. And he says that he agrees in the way it was written originally, which was what to the black man? So we disagree on his second principle of life. He says, third, I have given my sacred oath, quote, to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, what did I say earlier was the cornerstone of the unity of the white race in America? And if we were to have a righteous revolution, what would we have to destroy? And here comes a guy who says that his sacred oath is to protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What does that make the relationship between he and I? Enemy. Check. Take him out. Pardon me? That's right. That do we have the right to overthrow what's unrighteous? No question. No question. No question. So uh, we believe in that. Uh, but my point, but my point is clear. When you go back and look to see what he believes in, you'll pick up on what he's saying in the book. He isn't against the new world order. He says it needs to be worked and come out a little better than it's going. He talks in here about the aliens, said that Truman met with the aliens and they agreed to let the aliens come down and pick people up and take them away as long as they return them where they pick them up from. That's a bunch of bullshit. That's just bullshit. I just, I hate to say it, but it's bullshit. But he got good access to the community. And I think it was done without study. And I am suggesting that those who brought him study him or be held in account for what he says since you brought it. This is very important that we do this and you understand what I'm saying, correct? In another chapter called Secret World Societies and New World Order, now we start getting into that dialogue that Osiris, Horus, Isis, Mayat, and everything original African was paganism, primitive, uncivilized, and Lucifer worship. And that's a damn lie. And Epperson says the same thing in his chapters on Lucifer, on his chapter on the pyramids, on his chapter on 
uh, Lucifer worship, serpent stars and the sun, concealed mysteries, ancient mysteries, the New Age movement, every one of the first nine chapters condemn Africa in some subtle way or another. I know Epperson. Epperson seeks counsel with me. I refuse to sit down with him because I know he's a white supremacist. And even though he's using some important dialogue to get into the community, I know he ain't worth the paper he printed on. And I know he knows greater truths than he has got the right to print. And so we're not going to get hung up on a couple of white guys sharing some information that's half truth. Or, 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 we do what I had to do when I went out and bought none that call a conspiracy in Rockefeller file and gave away four or five thousand of each book. Is that in each book I put a disclaimer in it. A note on the side to my friend say, you will read this book and see that these white men hate black people. But I want you to look past that into this fight between two white people over which one going to rule over us. It's a fight between a poor white and a rich white. And I want you to focus on that. Pick them up right there. But you must understand that the other comments made against us should not hold you back. See past that. Enjoy this journey. I would love to talk to you about the same subject, but you have refused to accept it from me, so I give it to you in another form. And I paid for those books and I gave them away. So, None Dead Call a Conspiracy by Gary Allen and The Rockefeller File by Gary Allen. Two very instrumental books in turning me on to the core of this secret society. And it led me to Tragedy and Hope, because he quoted Tragedy and Hope and America's Secret Establishment. Then I got the books and found there was more in those books than they even said. And there was more against us than they ever said, but since they ain't us, they didn't have us in the book. So they... None dare call it conspiracy and the Rockefeller file, both run by Gary Allen, who was a big time uh, writer on the secret societies and he died a couple of years ago. And the guy who wrote the foreword to the book, Larry McDonald, died in that 007 plane crash that was shot down over Korea. Yes, sir. Yeah, he was big time in the John Birch Society, and so they be killing them too, so ain't no big deal there. Uh, but in this chapter on secret societies, uh, he talks about the oldest is the brotherhood of the snake and the brotherhood of the dragon. He calls them both Lucifer. Uh, he says, uh, he takes Albert Pike, and he does this. The most important of all these ancient groups is the brotherhood of the snake and the dragon, and was simply known as the mysteries. The snake and the dragon are symbols, symbols that represent wisdom. The father of wisdom is Lucifer, also called the light bearer. The focus of worship for the mysteries was Osiris, another name for Lucifer. See, he's just taking Osiris. Brother Maurice, you've been to Kemet. You've been to the pyramids. You are very knowledgeable in the original African Akibalon Kemet way. Was Osiris hooked with Lucifer? And in fact, the people that called it Lucifer is a concept that came later with the white man. There was no concept of the devil in ancient Kemet. There was no evil person running around with horns on their head and fire in their breath. This was just come out the caves of Europe. So now they're taking cave analogy and putting it on great African things. And that's not good. Osiris is the name of the bright star that the ancients believed had been cast down onto earth. The literal meaning of Lucifer is bringer of light, or morning star. After Osiris was gone from the sky, the ancients saw the sun as representation of Osiris, or more correctly, Lucifer. Then it has a quote from Albert Pike, Osiris was represented by the sun. That's the end of the quote. He just want to get Pike saying Osiris. Now Pike, who reformed Scottish Rite masonry, he heard of some great African things, like the white boys put the pyramid on the dollar. They never went there. So he heard of some great things and wrote of them like a legend or a fable. But then they started trivializing it. Now, his answer to all of this is Christianity. His form of Christianity was colonization. But he won't give honor to Christianity as a colonizer. Then he speaks against the Masons, but he loves the Masons' constitution. Then he speaks against all the black things, original black things. Then he has a comment about Jewish people saying, in fact, it's real silly comment because if you watch him carefully, he's, he needs to read the secret relationship of blacks and Jews because he say the Jewish people ain't so bad of a people. He white boy, old fat belly, beer drinking white boy from California or Arizona, wherever he's from. 
Uh, but uh, he has a part in here saying that uh, you, if you think that the Jewish people helped kill other Jewish people, then you have, uh, you have uh, departed from reality. And I want to find the quote because you need to hear it. Uh, it's just a statement. Uh, and what it does is it, its statement in itself repudiates the transfer agreement or Zionism in the age of dictators or Jews in America today, by, both by Lenny Brenner, or other documents that expose that Zionists did help Hitler. Gave him $1 million in 1939. Here's it right here. It says, the one group scenario, except for the Illuminati, has been used effectively to divert your attention from the truth. If it, it has caused you to fight each other in a manipulation that always leads to the real conspiracy closer to its ultimate goal, a new world order. Those of you who believe that Hitler was financed by Jews so that he could murder Jews has a serious logic deficit. Well, get transfer agreement. Look on page 39. I don't even need to see it. I ain't seen it in two years. On page 39 is about the one million dollars that the ADL and the American Jewish Congress gave Hitler for a worldwide publicity program that put him in the saddle for 1940. And we do know Zionism in the age of dictators, Jews in America today, and transfer agreement was about 60,000 Jewish people paying Hitler money to get out of town on Friday before he opened up the ovens on Saturday. But old boy come along with no research and say that ain't true, and that contradicts the secret relationship of blacks and Jews. Then he has a big thing about the Illuminati, and I keep telling everybody, the Illuminati is not the name of the people that we're chasing. It's a name that's used publicly to describe them, but you can go nowhere and find anything entitled Illuminati. And even if you read what he said, Weisfeld said, our name will never appear before the public except for in front names. See, Illuminati is a front name. Rhodes Rothschild Secret Society is the real name. And even amongst the Rose Rothschild Secret Society, it used to be called the Cleveland Set, the Rose Group, the Milner Group, the Kindergarten Club, or the Round Table. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, very easily determined that uh, some reason he wasn't going to bust the Jewish people too tough. But then in the back of the book, he puts the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, all 24 protocols. Now, you can't believe in the protocols, but then make the statement you made. They don't, they don't, they don't coincide. Uh, there are other things in here that are good, and there are more things that are bad. Uh, I suggest that you get the tape, but keep your eye on these two white boys. Don't be so willing to let them come around the community. They need to be pre-screened. Uh, them and Epperson, uh, they have no access to no information that is not retrievable within the race. So uh, we be uh, careful about them. One last thing I want to conclude with about the Blue Lake. Uh, we have found a very important recent information about the Boule. Uh, this is a handbook that we got on the Boule from Atlanta. A little brother who was going to college on a Boule Foundation scholarship. Boule is a Greek word, means advisor to the king. It's a secret black male fraternal order started in 1904 by Henry Minton in Philadelphia. It has 96 chapters worldwide and 2,980 members. The Boule, Advisors to the King, is the name used to describe the lower house in Greece today, like the House of Lords, House of Commons, Senate, Congress. The Boule is like the Congress, the House of Lords, the lower leadership body, uh, missed a greater leadership body, which is, of course, the white man. Advisor to the King means who is the king, and uh, we have studied the Boule. There's some tapes up there on the Boule. We talked about the Boule when we were here last. Uh, and... Uh, uh, in this handbook, we got some very good information uh, describing the seven or eight positions of the Boule, what they do, it's in the tape, uh, as well as uh, uh, some more history of the organization, the theme song of the organization that they sang for each other, uh, which is things like, uh, each archon who has dared to taste of the cup that threatened death, dear Sigma Pi Phi will defend with his life and dying death. Should any for a Greek assail, his cunning words shall not avail. Our ears are deaf to envy's tale, even deaf to envy's tale. I Meaning anybody who talk against us, we can't hear them no way. And so we be conscious of that. Uh, but uh, what I want to mention here, we find that they list their meeting dates all the way up to the year 1994, stating who and where every meeting will be held at. 
Uh, we also see profiles of each of the members, profiles of the committee structure, and those things are located in Blue Lake Tape 1 and 2. Uh, I don't have enough time to go through all of that this round. Maybe on my next trip, I'll be back in November. I'd be willing to come and give a lecture just on the Boule so that it would be available. This is what the Boule Journal looks like. That's Kurt Smoke, mayor of Baltimore, who is a Boule as well as a Rhodes Scholar. This is the first article that ever appeared. Huh? For legalizing drugs. No question. Uh, this is the first article ever appeared on the Boulay, July 18, 1990, here in the LA Times, where they had the annual meeting at at that time. The Boulay's annual meeting, which is a biannual meeting, was just held July 17th in Kansas City. We know in the past it had emulated skull and bones. The colors of the Boulay are blue and white. The logo of the Boulay is what they call the Grecian Sphinx. And in Atlanta recently, a doctor, medical doctor from South Carolina last Saturday, a week from today, accosted me in the restaurant of the beautiful Barclay Hotel there by the Yahweh Bin Yahweh in Atlanta. In fact, the Savior's Day is there. I know they booked out. They booked every room because the nation going to be there and it's the right place to be when you're in Atlanta. But a boule guy accosted me in the room, uh, in the restaurant there and told me, he just got up in my face. He said, uh, I don't really like you very much. And I think uh, I ought to tell you that. Uh, I said, you know me? He said, yeah, you're Steve Coakley, and I don't really like you too much. I said, well, why don't you sit down and tell me what it is you don't like? He said, well, I ain't got much time. I've got to go upstairs to the ASCAC meeting. But I just want to let you know that if you want to attract honey, I mean, if you want to attract bees, you need honey. So while I'm trying to attract the bees with the honey, you scaring the bees off. I said, well, my understanding of reality is that the attractiveness of your honey is hedged in the strength of my stinger. So to avoid my stinger, they will love your honey, but without my stinger, your honey is a lack of compelling moment. And uh, the next day, the next morning at 8 a.m., he called me up in my hotel room. I didn't finish my lecture until midnight. I finished eating at 3 a.m. I went to bed at 5 at 8. He called me up, said, brother, I'm leaving town. I need to talk to you. I want to give you some information from ASCAC and tell you what we're about. And I came downstairs and met him. And uh, I went to show him the Boulay book to ask him if uh, he knew any of the people from South Carolina where he had given me his card from, if he knew any of the people that were in the program so he could tell me who was on the Boulay. And he said, oh, you know. And I said, no what? He said, I'm in the Boulay. I said, oh, this is a medical doctor from South Carolina, Clarksburg. I mean, uh, not Clarksburg, Columbia, South Carolina. And so uh, he said, I'm in the Boulé, and I don't really like the tapes that you made on the Boulé. I heard the tapes. A sister in South Carolina got a tape from Washington, D.C., a Baltimore, Brother Nati, bookstore, everyone's place, which has some of the books that we be talking about a lot, too, because Brother does the great lengths to get the books. And uh, called, she went back to uh, South Carolina and called the brother up because they're both in ASCAC, she said, hey, I just went to Washington, I got these tapes on his brother, and boy, he mentioned something called the Boule. 10.30 at night, he left his house, drove uh, 45 minutes, uh, 20 miles, to go to sister's house to listen to the tape. He never told her he was in the Boule. He took the tapes home, heard the tapes, asked her for every other tape that she had, heard the tapes, took them to the Boule meeting, let the Boule people hear the tapes. And so then when I got to Atlanta, he was there to scold me. And telling me that he had three or four guys in the boule that wanted to be like an ASCAC. But when I be out talking all this revolutionary stuff, I scare them away. And I said, well, brother, where are you going? And where are those other three going? So we can make some decision as to you not getting where you're going is of some adverse impact on us. And so, uh, brother, then uh, his attack was preceded uh, by an hour's discussion. Then came the head of ASCAC, Sister Nzinga Rakabisha, who's right here from Los Angeles. And she came in and saw me and the Boulé guy talking, and she said, you don't have to answer his questions. Don't let him interrogate you. Who do you think he is? God, he ain't got no right to be messing with you. The Boulé is all right. You have to learn to leave the Boulé alone. Now, this is the group for the African study. The, what's the, how does it go? ASCAC is the African study of classical African information or something like that. Right? But now here's the African classical people defending the Greek impersonators. And she condemns me. Now, everybody knows this sister. She's a very prominent sister. She runs ASCAC. She works for IBM. She doesn't go to work because IBM pays for her to run the group. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact. It's a fact. 
Uh, she brags about not having to go to work because she got IBM tamed. But uh, anybody know that if uh, somebody worked for old blue eyes all day and run black eyes at night, you'd know something funky up in there. Uh, we also know that uh, I said, sister, let me ask this brother one last question because he's got to go. I said, brother, what does this mean? I showed the brother the logo. I said, brother, what does this mean? And brother said, he looked at it, he said, man, I really don't know. I said, brother, what does this mean? And he said, I really don't know. I kept showing the guy from the boule the logo, and I said, what does this mean? And Sister Nzinga keeps interrupting me by saying, you ain't got to answer that. Don't you be, boy, you know, like talking loud and stuff. And so I said, sister, I have interviewed this man, and he's a material witness to a crime. And I need to know whether to call him up for the grand jury and indict him, or call him in as a witness, or leave his ass alone. And so I'm trying to ask him, and for an hour he was giving me very honest answers. I thought, which is why I asked him what the code was, because the real measurement is, is he brother doctor or doctor brother? See, I always, when we talk about college, we call him Brother Doctor. We say Brother Minister Farrakhan. They don't say Minister, we say Brother Minister. Brother is the first salutation amongst brothers. It supersedes all other salutations. Sister supersedes all other salutations amongst sisters. And so, is he Brother Doctor or Doctor Brother? And so, when he told me he didn't know what this meant, I turned to sister and said, you see, I got to call him to the grand jury because he still will support the group before he support a brother. And I said, man, don't you have a pen with this on it? He said, yeah, but I don't even know where it is. But then when we got the Constitution the other night, it says that the pen is so important that when you die, that pen has to go to your grave or to your wife. And if your wife dies, that pen goes back to the group. That's how unimportant the pen is let alone that he wears an insignia or a symbol of a group and he don't know what it is. And we call it a griffin, they call it a Grecian sphinx. But Grecian and sphinx don't jive. But if you're a Greek impersonator, it do. And that is a major problem, but I was surprised that the African moderates have come out in support of the boule. In fact, sister told me that she went to the last boule meeting at St. Bonaventure Hotel here in LA, which is where they meet at. She told me that she has the membership list of all the current Boule people and she refuses it to share with anybody because it's confidential business. What? Ain't that deep? Yeah. Yes. I thought that was very significant too, which means that the other members are being denied the information about the impersonators. And uh, one thing I want to end with, we know on page 28 that the Boule emulates skull and bones. It's uh, what he says in his book about emulating skull and bones, but I want to draw attention to this guy who wrote the book, The History of Sigma Pi Phi. It's Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley wrote the history book for the Prince Hall Masons. He wrote the history book for the Black Elks. He wrote the history book for the Alpha Phi Alpha and of the Boule. He's the founding president of Central State University. And uh, Charles Wesley is being honored in this Boule Journal, Fall of 87. But it has a little quote in here. This is very significant in our development of boule information. We know they emulate skull and bones. We know they advise the white man without compromise. We know they won't finish first, but only second in agreement with this relationship. But lo and behold, one of the names for the secret society that we chase and chase and chase is the round table. And here is two remarks. It says, a model for a mighty world. And here is Charles Wesley's comments with Albert Lord, Alfred Lord Tennyson's comments, who was a member of that secret society with Cecil Rhodes in the late 1800s. And here's Charles Wesley on this side, and what are they talking about but the round table? Tennyson tells him, in that fair order of the table round, a glorious company, the flower of men, who rolled about redressing human wrong. Roll about addressing human wrong. They spoke no slander nor listened to it. Who served as a model for a mighty world. They loved one maiden only and lived for her through years of noblest deeds. That's how rights talk. It don't make much sense. It don't rhyme. 
it is goofy words, but in there he's saying that a group of people rose up to develop a mighty world. And they're known as the round table. Not this stuff to come on TV last night with the little FBI agents and stuff. Uh, playing out that they all want to be FBI, they the round table. Don't fall for that. Then comes Charles Wesley saying, the round table lives only in poetic life and history. They can live again in life and we can make them live through us. It can continue as a dream and it can continue again through us. Now, he can't say that the secret society that for years we wanted to expose to you exists. So he calls them a dream. Then he says they can live, but they got to live through the boule. But the boule can't tell of itself, nor can the boule tell of the secret society that it serves. So they call it like a dream. You'll live through us immortally, but only through us like a dream and reality. Talk like Jesse thing. Yeah. See, that's the key. You know, when we own them, when they get to talking like this, that's the signal of when you own them for a time. So you get up on them and they get to talking all that crazy stuff. So that let us know for absolute sure that the Boulay not only knew of the secret society, but aided and abetted it. And we know that they emulated all the other aspects of it, including its history or father, the Greekville. And so that brings us to an assumption. Since the Aztec and others came out and attacked me for messing with the Boulé, and uh, we remember that it was Boulé W.B. Du Bois that came out and attacked Marcus Garvey, saying that he was stirring up stuff in the black community and making it difficult for the talented Tiff to get paid. And so we understand that if we succeed, if the nation succeeds, if Yahweh succeeds, if Brother Cohen or Brother Coakley or Brother Marcus or the brothers and sisters at AMU or the other study group and here and there, if they succeed, then the others will have to fail. So they want to guarantee their success by impeding ours. And we have always said it's never a goal to kill a boule for their mere servants of a higher authority. But we will inform them that we mind to do, we tend to do business on their master. Please vacate the premises until we finish our job. But if you choose to stand up and support him, we will kill you like we will kill him. It is a mere result of the activity. And so we mean them no specific harm, uh, but if they show, we, we plan to do them. And uh, part of going around the country, the Boulé guy told me that the worst thing about what I'm doing is reading the names and the addresses of the Boulé people to the audience. So did I ever read, when I was here last time, the names of the Boulé in Pasadena, Altadena? Okay, I just want to make sure I got them in the record, because I got them right here. Mr. Ernest Samuel Chu, Dr. Herman Fitzbert Davis, Mr. Wendell Edwards, Mr. Richard Laverne Good, Mr. J. Rosenwald Jackson, Mr. Julius Johnson Esquire, Mr. Vernon Dudley Jones, Dr. William, huh? Uh -huh. Yeah. Who that? that yeah? The cleaning business. Right there, right there it said 2072 East Altadena Drive, Altadena, California. Oh, oh go get them, brother man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh? Well, they got a new magazine called Biracial Magazine. We should submit them in it. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Williams, Dennison, McClire, McIntyre, McIntyre, McIntyre. There you go. What'd he do? Uh, I remember the last time. Alfred F. Moses, attorney, Dr. Benjamin Montree, uh, Dr. Rodney Armand Richard, Mr. Paul Earl Scranton, Jr., Mr. Edward, Harold Edward Smallwood, Dr. Everett Horton Williams, 2185 Midwick Drive, Altadena, California. And some more of them got Altadena, some got Pasadena. 451 Devoria, no, I'm sorry, Deodora Drive, Altadena. That's Wendell Edwards and stuff. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we be acknowledging that. Uh, one last thing, if you all saw the profile of Cecil Murray in the Sunday magazine of the LA Times a couple of weeks ago, you will see that he raises over four million dollars a year on Sundays. Four million dollars. And in fact, there's one portion of the story that I hope you check because it shows a guy named Mark Whitlock shaking the hands of a white man. 
and it says a white man refuses to be identified is giving grant money to the uh, Reverend Murray to share with uh, to share with the people in South Central and I only wish I had it I got it up here uh, brother Ed I need your help he won't meet with the gangsters <laughs> not with the real ones brother no no because they are the gangsters they are the gangsters. I'm looking for that Cecil Murray story just so I can show it to you. Uh, but the thing I wanted to mention is, is that uh, this letter showed up at KPFK, uh, written by the program director at KPFK. Now it's written to a sister that you don't think much of, and I'm not going to get into that part of it. Oh well. well let me just let me just let me just do it this way here. Okay, and you say it's your opinion. In this case, Sister did a good job, right. uh, and it involved myself. Right. Uh, and uh, right. she was written this letter. Now we we got to put balance on it. Uh, I'm not a, know enough about those other things, and to make it clear, you'll have to. You told me some of it about not being able to get on the air and other things. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, but uh, let's read the letter from Alan Fong to Jan Robinson Flint regarding Steve Coakley interview. I need a copy of that tape, Jan, no more runaround. When I asked you if you had it, you said Marcus would bring it with him last Wednesday. Edit that tape. No, no, he's just turning it over. Well, I mean, when you give it to him, edit it all up like they do Malcolm's tapes. Oh, I don't edit. Mine's live and uncensored. I know, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's right, so we can't edit it. Uh, I need a copy of that tape, Jan, no more runaround. When I asked you if you had it and you said Marcus would bring it with him last Wednesday, when I asked him, he said he'd have to get it from someone else. I was on KPFK May 6, 1992 in the middle of the rebellion, but I was on the radio from Washington, D.C., on the phone via radio. And, uh, and uh, I made some statements about the fireman, FEMA, Murray, the rebellion, and other things. Well, this is what, this is what went on under the cover. Let, so the tape, they asked for the tape. Somebody came in and asked for the tape so they could sue Coakley. For a while, we thought it was the Jewish people because they played it out like a Jewish thing. But lo and behold, it may not have been them at all. Uh, in fact, Sister Nzinga said that she called Cecil Murray and told him I was on the radio speaking against him. And I need to leave him alone. I said, what about Operation Cool Down? She said, well, we don't need no violence in the street. What we need is a bunch of hooligans tearing up. That's the problem now. Well, I wait till I tell them hooligans what you think of them. And wonder how many of y'all worked at IBM for the hooligans threw down in the 60s. Right, right. Who are now adults like her age. Let me ask you a question. When you heard Larry Binsky describe the difference between opinion and libel, did you think about the Coakley interview? Remember, libel involves asserting statements as facts, things people do in their associations. Chip Murray, FEMA, and Fane. Do you know what you have done, Jan Robinson Flint? Please see the attached article and consider it. Do you see that it shows clearly that KPFK's air is being monitored? At least this note should represent a learning experience. Among the possibilities, I might have to suspend you from the air. And this note includes my thoughts on your work as the Uprising and Beyond coordinator. And I guess what happened was they needed to feed stories nationally about what was going on locally on the rebellion, so they picked the sister to be the national coordinator. Some of it was very good. Some of it raised the ire of the Korean community. I did not hear most of it, but what I did hear reflects the mixed reviews, some good, some divisive. I expected more from you and spoke of entrusting you with the Pacifica mission statement. I also realized that if there is any more coverage, it will have to start from scratch. On the other hand, I brought you this stranger named Lennon Brown who proceeded to insult you. My apologies to you for any insult he may have caused you, which after I had learned about it caused me to talk to him. What it is, I've tried to learn from what I've done and I've mixed experience both in hiring you as a coordinator and in trying to bring Mr. Brown in as a volunteer for our continued coverage, which so far is missing in action. To summarize, I need that tape, Jan, and no more of Mr. Coakley. I simply don't know if you can handle his talk in terms of context of our mission. I won't even begin to know that until you give me the tape. Then he puts this story in here, which doesn't say where it came from. It came from a magazine called Commit, 
summer 92, received 618.92, and it mentions some over here, some guy who wrote the preceding article from San Diego, so we know it's from somewhere, we don't know where. It says, Pacifica Station KPFK Los Angeles is a 110,000 watt public radio station whose signal can be heard from all the way from Los Angeles to San Diego, an area of more than 20 million people. During the Cold War, its public affairs programming was devoted to the promotion of Marxist guerrilla movements in communist police states. Because you see the old socialist connection is all up in Pacifica. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The head of Pacifica is Jack O'Dell, who Martin King was warned not to hang around with by J. Edgar Hoover in the White House because he was an avowed communist. Communism ain't no strategy in our arsenal. Uh, it says that, uh, blah, 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 oh, oh, it got Farrakhan probably. It says it, it gave, it even gave over its airtime to pro-Qaddafi group during the air raid on Libya. It has from time to time aired hour-long hangarons from Louis Farrakhan and Farrakhan's lieutenant Steve Coakley and other privilege of racial hatred. On May 6th, a week after the riots began, a KPFK host introduced Farrakhan's lieutenant Steve Coakley who was on the line from Chicago, it was actually Washington. Coakley, who made a name for himself by accusing Jewish doctors of injecting blacks with AIDS, used his airtime to insinuate that the Federal Emergency Administration might have played a sinister role in either setting up or conspiring to prevent the control of the fires set during the riots a week later. Oh, excuse me, a week later, Attorney William Kunstler was claimed, claimed on KPFK that the FBI had set the, some of the fires. Then Coakley concluded, quote, let me just say one last thing. Many people from around the country are making a surprise visit to Los Angeles. Myself and others included <coughs> will be showing up there shortly. We are bringing some names of those people who, if there ever was a second round, and we can thank LA for Westwood, Beverly Hills, and other portions where the whites called this an unusual phenomenon, that blacks would go into the white neighborhoods and that happened all over the country. And this is a unique and different response than what we've seen in the past. And that ends my little quote, just insinuating that I'm insinuating that we go into the white neighborhoods, if it happened again. Now comes Jan's letter back to Aaron Allen Fong. In the meantime, the brothers have been calling West Coast, said, brother, you've been bad from KPFK. I said, well, what? Except for them little 20 minutes you did. You've been banned. You ain't never be on. They had a big meeting here, and Brother Austin knew, and others went and demanded. They marched on the people. They removed the ban. Uh, this is the letter that Jan wrote back. This is a response to your memo dated June 18th, which I received July 7th. One, you need a copy of that tape. I do not have an air check of the program or interview with Steve Coakley of May 6th. I have at no time indicated to you that I have or had an air check of it only that possibly Marcus Lewis, the board operator, might have a copy of the particular program in question and I would ask him. I did ask him and he indicated that he would check around and see if he could come up with a copy. Two, I perceived a threat that I would be suspended from the air if in fact I did not produce a copy of the tape program. Is this a Pacific policy? Suspension from the air of no air check tape of a program is made? Has it been written or communicated to the programmers in any form? Does Pacific or KPFK simply air check tape, supply air, air check tape for purposes in the control room? Or is this a responsibility of the board operator since it carries such a penalty if they do not air check their program? Yes, I am clear on the definition of libel and opinion. And yes, I know the difference between opinion and fact. I attended the Larry Binsky workshop, asked the question for clarification, and incorporated this knowledge for future reference. According to my calendar, however, this workshop is dated after the interview with Copley. The inference here is that either FEMA, FAME, or Cecil Murray has been liable. I need detailed information as to exactly what you are talking about. Where is the libel? It might also be interesting to note that who brought this to your attention and request the information in question from that individual since they perceived the libel and offered the threat of a suit if there is one. What responsibility do producers, hosts, and programmers have for the opinion, facts, or information that guests offer? Are we going through this procedure with every guest, every bit of information on every program with every subject matter, whether it be water or clean air or the political association each person might or might not have? Are we required to research each person and every word, idea, and person on every program preceding the program? 
to answer your question, no, I do not know what I have done, but what have I done, especially in regards to FEMA fame and Pastor Murray. If KPFK is being monitored, it's nothing new. In fact, I recommend it that resources be spent to increase listenership and monitoring. Isn't that what we want, people to listen to the station? What is there to be afraid of? The right-wing politics of this country, religious and special interest groups, being taken off the air by the FCC? What is the real problem you have with being monitored? And then she goes, goes on to respond to some other things that she said. Last part is number 12, quote, no more of Mr. Coakley. Is this 1992 McCarthyism, if I've ever seen it? If Mr. Coakley is banned from the air, as Fernando Vasquez, Mohamed Martinez, Ken Carr, and perhaps myself and Ron Wilkins, all people of color, then who is next? Where will it end? What type of people are you looking to put on the air? Sanctioned by whom? A very dangerous president is being set by Alan Pong. No due process, restriction of freedom of the press, speech, censorship of people and ideas. How much a part of this are you willing to play? And uh, she just goes on and gives some more response. To summarize, this feels like a winch hut of the African and Latino programmers. It's Max of McCarthyism. It's a sad day for KPFK, and I simply cannot produce a tape I do not have. And I appreciate the sisters' defense of my right to speak. Not yet. I appreciate the sisters' defense of my right to speak. I understand that after the program, FEMA approached her about giving her a job brought her an application and attempted to pull her away from KPFK and Brother Marcus. Now I know they study Brother Marcus, they say, well he over the line, he with Maurice and Osapu and, and they over the line, but they tried to work on the other sister. So maybe the sister is not through in formation yet and maybe Brother's apprehensions can be verified or repudiated, it's not the point. The point is, is that when the hottest time came, she held the water. And maybe she held it because she was more afraid of us than afraid of them. You have to give consideration to the consequences of betrayal in certain circumstances. And you may betray a lesser light in consideration of no fear of retaliation. So I give thanks for the fact that she held water. I give appreciation to Brother Marcus, who uh, when Jan said be on five minutes, Marcus say I, I had you on for 30. So there was conflict in even me being on. But when the trouble came, even though she didn't put me on the air, Brother Marcus did, and even though she controlled the mic, Brother Marcus put me on, but I do appreciate her holding the water when maybe she may not wanted to, but she did in this particular case, and we need to protect the sister. We need to protect, protect her because maybe this is now her major move. Maybe now that she's over the line and been caught aiding and abetting the revolution, maybe there's no place for her with them anymore. And uh, I know a sister in Zynga in Atlanta said, and that Marcus Lewis and that Jan Robinson, irresponsible losers. They shouldn't even have had you on the air anyway. And then she said, I called Cecil Murray and told him. She said, I also tried to break up that damn united front they had out there. Was there some sort of group that was united, united front during the rebellion, tried to do some things, sister put herself on the record for trying to break it up. And when I told the people who were in the group, that helped them better understand the things that she did when she was at the meetings, because that tended to vouch, though she never told them she wanted to break it up, and no real black person would do it, maybe if you work 5 p.m. And so uh, uh, there was a major disruption. Um, I'm going to end now. Uh, we have worked long. I see it's uh, something after 12. I got a baby and a sister to feed, uh, and I'm taking about a good hour to get back home. So just me leaving you is not the end of my journey. Uh, I'll be out of town on Wednesday. Need to write this number down. This is my new number in Long Beach. I just took an apartment out in Long Beach. So it looks like I need to stick around here a little bit more often than I have. So I took down an apartment, cut down some of that hotel costs. It'll work out for all of us. Just being here with you tonight helps me be able to come back here again. So I appreciate the support from the brothers and sisters here uh, at the Pasadena Altadena Study Group. I really appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, it's never fun having to be on the point and name the names. Uh, but it's a task that must be done. I stand to be corrected. I, I'm open for suggestion and correction. Uh, that's part of being willing to stand up here is to deal with the fallout. 
uh, uh, but I know that we have to do the best we can and hope the best come out of it. Area code 310 uh, 435 -0595. If I'm not there on the floor for any answering uh, service will answer and just leave a message I can pick you up from anywhere in the country. 435-435-0595, area code 310. I'm leaving Tuesday. I'll go to Washington, D.C. I'll be in the Howard Inn Hotel there for about 10 days after that uh, to host a couple of lectures in Washington, uh, including one at Howard University one week from tonight. Uh, the Big Black Caucus meeting and the Big Boule come to town during the Black Caucus meeting. They'll be in Washington at the same time, so I look forward to harassing them. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, the whole town of D.C. is in an uproar over Marion Berry's victory. And uh, the mayor came out and uh, stopped the condemnations of Berry because she smells them a-coming. And uh, we only wish she had stuck with Dr. Arlene. What kind of victory? City Council? City Council, yes. City Council representative. They only have it, uh, nine in all, and a mayor. So he is now uh, head of Ward 8, beat assistant named Wilhelmina Rolar, whose husband is head of uh, Africare. Uh, one of the, he's got a big foundation in uh, Washington that's real boule type acting. He's boule too, so this is all in the cards. Uh, I appreciate your support. Brother, I don't want to, oh, stop, 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 stop. Let me give, yeah, go ahead. I don't, I don't want to say about her other programs, not, not that one interview, where she went quiet and, and finally, the first time, that was the only interview I heard that she handled. The other interviews, silly, acting like a, I'm sorry, but something standing on the street selling her body. She was acting like that on the radio. And I mean, it was way out, like a, uh, like uh, the silly programs on Channel 11, the Fox Network. You know those black programs on the Fox Network? They live in color. That's what she was behaving like. Mm -hmm. On air, except for that one program with me. Well, and that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank I you. haven't heard enough of the programs to know how well she holds the line. But I mean, real stupid, silly. I waited your turn. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so I want to let you state your piece because you're the people. And we can never not let the people talk. We can agree or disagree with what the people say, but the people must talk. I have a responsibility to let the people speak, too. Uh, but I do say this, is that uh, uh, we've been working with the sister since the incident, and uh, let's just hope the future bears greater than the past. Yes, you want to say something? Is Africa owned and uh, run by black folks? Uh, no, no, no. Anyway, I thank you all. I'm, I'm, I'm really through, y'all. I need to stop. It's just going to take me a half an hour to box up and an hour to get home. And I just need to stop. I just need to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's not in deference or disrespect to anyone's question. I'm just tired. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, this box. Uh, let's just stack it up. Even going deep. That's what I'm saying. Then and then. If anybody wants any tapes, please come on up. We need to do that and uh, do it quick and the best we can. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yeah, but I had a baby, so we was all the crap for weeks. I was didn't speak at all. Uh, let me see some of this. Uh, we had the information.